groups, choirs, and congregations, this song of praise soars with the lovely images of the break of day. Please rise in body, rise in spirit to sing, Morning Has Broken. light this chalice to honor the flame that burns inside each of us, and also to honor the flame we will soon light inside each other. May our spirits be touched and moved so that we may grow and shine together. We invite you to join in singing again this lovely centering chant by Unitarian Universalist composer Henry Fleury. Please rise in body, rise in spirit, lift your voices, and let us join our voices again in song. We will sing the words five times together.
Please be seated. Good morning. We would like to invite you into a story, and the story requires your participation. So I'm going to ask you to be excited this early morning to do your part. Are you ready? Great. So two things. We'll show you the hand motions, and I'll cut you off. That's all I need to know. After that, we're good to go. So first, we're gonna, in the story, we're going to create wind by doing this. Easy. Next, we're going to create an earthquake by doing this. And then the illusion of fire. And lastly, there'll be a stillness. Fifty years ago, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. addressed our assembly, saying, don't sleep through the revolution. His words inspired us and challenged us as only the words of a friend can. He said, there are those wonderful moments in life when you speak before a group that is so near and dear to you that you don't feel like you have to engage in the art of persuasion. You don't feel like there, you are in the midst of strangers. You know that you are with friends. I can assure you I feel that way tonight. In the Torah, in the Book of Kings, there is Elijah's story. God's prophet who is suffering. He speaks God's message, but the people aren't ready to hear it. Elijah flees for his life and finds God. Elijah takes refuge in a cave. We know the story. God asks, Elijah, what are you doing here? And Elijah replies, I've been very zealous for the Lord. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountain apart and shattered the rocks, but the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. When Elijah came out, he pulled his cloak over his face and stood at the mouth of the cave. And then a voice said to him quietly, what are you doing here, Elijah? In the religious history of North America over the last four centuries, there have been three great awakenings in Protestant Christianity. The first great awakening happened before the American Revolution. The preachers in this awakening spoke with great fervor about God's wrath. The spirit, as they understood it, was among them. They spoke with a great wind. But that wasn't us. The second great awakening, which began about 1790 and ended before the Civil War, was like an earthquake. Clergy brought the message that Jesus' second coming was coming and he would judge the quick and the dead and the world would soon end. But that wasn't us. One interpretation of the Third Great Awakening is the fundamentalism which started in the early 20th century. It is burned through our culture like a fire. In its rejection of modernism, it seeks a simpler time, a time that's less complex that wasn't us either, but that's the way we know because we've lived through it. We weren't the great wind describing an angry God. We weren't the earthquake predicting the world's end. We weren't the people with a burning fire trying to go back to a simpler time. But now it is time for a new great awakening, the awakening of the gentle whisper. the still, small voice. We listen to the gentle voice of God's question, Elijah, what are you doing here? 
after the terrible wind, after the earth shook, after the sides of the mountain burst, there was a quiet, loving voice. This is us. This is our time. This is the question Dr. King asked us. What are you doing here? There is a fire out there, a fire stoked by fear, fear of the unknown, of loss of power, of the other. But we know deep in our souls, there is no other. We know that all humanity, indeed our whole planet, are in this together. We cannot be separate from them because no separation exists. There is no other. Dr. King implored us not to sleep through the revolution. We are in that revolution right now, and it is our time. We are the ones that we need right now. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the voice of reason and passion and compassion. Make no mistake, this is the next great awakening, and we must make it the awakening of coming together, of embracing and celebrating the beautiful diversity of theologies, philosophies, and ways of being in this world. These different pieces, like the different colors in a stained glass window, are marvelous. We practice living with people who love differently than we do, whose theology is different than ours, who appear different from us. And though we are not perfect, we are not perfect in this practice of creating beautiful church windows filled with glorious colors, we are more practiced at it than most. We can be the imperfect teachers of this craft. To be really present. Okay. Now that you've had a chance to be really present in your body, connected to the earth and to the arc of history, I'd like to invite you now to reflect on the words of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. He said, forgive us for what we could have been, but what we failed to be. That's a tough one for most Unitarian Universalists because to be forgiven, we first must have sinned. And it's not easy to think of ourselves as sinners. Even as we seek to redeem ourselves from our mistakes, we tend to make sin bigger than it is, as if it leads directly to damnation. But King's words define sin and suggest a solution. Forgive us for what we could have been but failed to be. We all seek to be our best, and we all fail sometimes. Most of the time, our shortcomings are small, imperceptible to all but ourselves, easily forgotten or justified. But sometimes our shortcomings are greater hard to forget, indefensible. Sometimes we do things that hurt others and we don't even know we've done anything wrong until later. We failed to address injustice that we didn't see. We failed to see the needs of others right in front of us. We carry these shortcomings with us for weeks, years, even decades. They can be enormous afflictions that encumber us, or more likely they're smaller, like a splinter that is unnoticeable at first, but grows more painful over time than dulls, so that we learn to live with it. Then there are sins for which we know right from the beginning we must seek forgiveness. Either way, our shortcomings can become burdens burdens that hold us down. What is your burden? What is one positive, life-affirming, soul-sustaining, or justice-making thing that you could have been but failed to be? Feel the weight of it on your body. 
Is it light and easy to bear? Or is it heavy and slumping down your shoulders? Now I'm going to ask you to take a risk. Not to expose the deepest secrets of your souls, not to share details, but to risk letting someone next to you know that you have a burden. So please, turn to someone near you, ideally somebody that you don't know. And just look at each other. Acknowledge one another's presence, your being. And one of you say to the other, neighbor, good morning. I have a burden. Will you stay with me as I lay it down? And now the other, if you haven't already done so, look at your neighbor and say, good morning, neighbor. I have a burden. Will you stay with me as I lay it down? I bring to you a thing from the past, from our 1935 Red Hymnal, you might remember it, Hymns of the Spirit, from the 10th Order of Service, I bring to you an order of confession written by Unitarians for ourselves. Please read with me on the screens the following words. Before the wonders of, if we are failures to see, and to revere before the sanctity of his life we are ashamed of our disrespects and indignities before the gifts of life we have made a choice of lesser goods and today seek the spirit the spirit before the heroisms of a new life we would like large new option Peace be with you. Lift up your hearts. Every time I feel this way, this old familiar sinking, I will lay my troubles down by the water where the river will never run dry. I'm gonna let myself be Myself be lifted. I'm gonna let myself be lifted. I am by will lay my troubles down by the water where the river will never run dry. It's been said and I do believe as you are. Bring the sweet release when the river will never run dry. I'm gonna let myself be lifted. I'm gonna let myself be lifted. I'm gonna let myself be lifted. Be lifted. I'm gonna let myself be lifted. 
This past December, there was an article in the local news that just unhinged me completely. It was about a robbery at a Speedway gasoline mini mart. A man went into the mini mart, stole a case of beer, and then fled by car. But what made this robbery different was that there was another man in the store who had a concealed carry weapon and that man pulled out his weapon and shot at the thief as he was fleeing, having confronted no one. But what really unhinged me was the note in the news article that said that the only official response was that the police had taken that man's weapon and then sent him home on his own recognizance. What world do we live in where it is possible to attempt murder and still be home in time for dinner. I know that part of what unhinged me about this story is I remember the last time I was at that mini mart, that very gas station. And let me just say, I am not someone who is usually noticed at gasoline mini marts. I, uh, you know all those Facebook apps that tell us what our magic powers are? I don't need that. I, I know what my magic power is. As a white, middle-class, middle-aged, female-identified person who drives an ancient Prius, I have complete invisibility. <laughs> and my powers are at their height in a gasoline mini-mart in the suburbs of Columbus, Ohio. I squeal in, I pull out, I've gotten eight gallons of gas, and no one has seen a thing at all. <laughs> But this last time I was at the Speedway, it was a little different. I was on my way to go meet my friend Sheikh Tahir Watt. Um, we were going to spend the afternoon together talking about history and Unitarianism and Islam. And I began to wonder what would have happened if I had stopped at the Speedway after meeting him when I was driving him back to his hotel. What would that whole scenario have been like if there was a concealed carry weapon, a vigilante, and what if we added to that equation a brown-skinned man in traditional Islamic dress? I don't know exactly what would have happened, but I'm positive we would not all have been home in time for dinner. I should tell you a little bit about my friend Sheikh Tahir. He is the English language imam at the Prophet's Mosque in Saudi Arabia. And he is studying Unitarian history because he and his fellow imams believe that we hold the key to a kind of bridge between righteous and wonderful Islamic identified people and a greater understanding of their religious tradition. You see, they believe that the best way to fight Islamic extremism is to make sure that Americans especially understand Islam before they hear perverted versions of it. But they're also, they are also keenly aware that as brown-skinned, Muslim-identified people, that America is likely not to listen to them as they give this message. So Sheikh Tahir is studying Unitarian Universalism because he believes that we can be that bridge. I want you to sit with that for a moment. I cannot tell you the depth of Sheikh Tahir's learning in our tradition either. It's truly amazing. I think it is entirely possible that the living person who knows the most about Unitarian Universalist history is a Sheikh in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> so what does that mean? He believes that we can be the still small voice that in this time can speak the multi-religious truth that 
fear, fear of other human beings, is not a religious habit of mind. So we wanted to give you a charge today. The first president of the UUA, Frederick May Elliott, used to say that what's distinctive about Unitarian Universalism is that it lays the hand of religious vocation on all of us. So I'm wondering if at this point in General Assembly, when there's so much up close and present, if we can't also take some time today and throughout the time we have left remaining to recommit ourselves to a larger ministry, to recommit ourselves to that message of that still small voice that we need to carry into each and every one of our communities. So today, I hope we can make this commitment to making our lights shine brighter, not because we believe in the glory of the light itself, but because we need it to illuminate this hurting world that needs our message. Dr. Issei Marie Barnwell gave a 2015 TED Talk on the power in vocal communities. She told her audience that songs have a way of pulling us together. We share a common bond and we activate every cell in our body, change ourselves, usually for the better. Issei Barnwell taught her audience two well-known songs. I'm sure you know this one. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Sing it with me. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine. How about glory, glory, hallelujah? You guys know that one? Let's sing that one with me. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I laid my burden down. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I laid my burden down. Now, what happens when we share these different songs, these different melodies with each other together at the same time? I will lead this side of the room singing Glory, Glory, Hallelujah, while Susan leads the other side of the room singing This Little Light of Mine. If you want to add some harmonies, or maybe your very own melody, feel free to do so as well. You ready? Please rise in body and spirit. One, two, one. Glory, glory. Down. Glory, 
Faced with the burdens of failure and disrespect, poor choices and shame, when like Elijah, we are separate from the holy and sustaining powers of transformation, when we fall short of being our best, there is a river in this heart of hearts. We know our highest good. And if we are willing, if we each do our part, the river will never run dry. And each of us will be enough to transform the world. May you go into this day knowing that you are enough. Our voices together are enough to change the world. Let's sing one more time in celebration. You can switch sides if you want. Here we go. Literally, two Americas. One America is overflowing with the milk of prosperity and the honey of opportunity. But tragically, there is another America. And this other America has a daily ugliness about it that constantly transforms the buoyancy of hope into the fatigue of despair. And as we look at this other America, we see it as an arena of blasted hopes and shattered dreams. And we should be bothered that at the same moment we are the wealthiest nation in the world, we're the poorest nation in the world. If someone doesn't have bread to eat or something to nourish the body, that's poverty. If someone does not have a decent education, that's poverty. Or if they get an education and they don't have a decent job, that's poverty. Or if they get a decent job and don't get decent wages, a living wage, that's poverty. We ought to be bothered by the fact that the gaps between the rich and the poor are greater, and we know that God made this world sufficient for all of us. We ought to be bothered when we have 62 million Americans, 54% of African Americans working at less than a living wage. And we are locking people up for fighting for 15 while corporate crooks are going free. One of the biggest current drivers of poverty right now is low wages. 68% of the children living in poverty live in families where there are working parents, 68%. 
82% of children living in families with incomes below twice the poverty line are living in families with working parents. One of the biggest stumbling blocks for adults in poverty is access to health care. For me, the expansion of health care is a pro-life issue. Eight million poor working people are not having health care today because of governors and legislators all over the country denying Medicaid expansion. 30,000 people are dying every year, not because it was their time to die, but because a governor or a legislature would not give them health care. God respects the poor. God exalts the poor. God cares for the poor. God feeds the poor. God remembers the poor. God helps the poor. There is a dangerous agenda afoot. This is what they're telling us. The way to a great nation is to attack public education and teachers, is to attack health care and the sick, is to attack the poor and undermine policies of uplift and, and, and fight $15 an hour as a minimum wage and fight fair trade and safety nets. All while we have 14 million poor children. In 2009, more people died from poverty than died from cancer, heart attacks, and strokes. Dangerous agenda where we, a nation of immigrants, are attacking immigrants and labor rights. It's a dangerous agenda afoot that says attack voting rights in ways that we haven't seen since the 19th century. And then when you've done all of this, make sure it's easier to get a gun than it is to vote. This is the agenda that's being sanctioned. Moral dissenters must stand up again today not just in our sanctuaries of safety, but we must carry the sanctuary into the public square. Build up, put down if you have to. Somebody must stand and say it doesn't matter what party is in power, who has the political supermajority. There are some things that transcend political majorities and mere majority politics and the narrow categories of liberal versus conservative. There are some things that must be challenged because they are wrong, they are extreme, and they are immoral. This nation is in bad shape. You're gonna have to learn to encourage America to live up to the better angel of her nature. What? 
Good morning. I now call to order the second general session of the 55th General Assembly of our Unitarian Universalist Association. Now, I know that Denny Davidoff has been to about 35, 36 general assemblies, and last year someone beat that record. So I want to know if anybody has attended more than 35 general assemblies. Raise your hand. Raise your card. Sleeping in? Oh, there we go. There we go. Would the tellers, would you please give me your name and, to the teller, and I'll, uh, I'll give you a shout out. Those of you that have been at more than 35 general sessions, that's longer than I'm old. <laughs> so we'll try to give you a shout out later. Maybe we can get you better seats, too. So I want to welcome back the secretary of our association, Rob Eller Isaacs, for the preliminary credentials report. Good morning, friends. Our superb registration staff reports to us that 154 delegates are with us virtually a growing number as we perfect our skills at involving people from around the world who can't be here in person, and that there are 1,061 delegates in attendance here, representing 757 of our congregations, 
total registration, including over 200 youth registrations, is 3,754, a solid gathering, friends. Before I call out uh, the right relationship team for their report, I have something I want to add to the agenda this morning. I regret that on Wednesday night's opening worship ceremony, one of our guests inserted himself into a family discussion and debate. About this debate, I had planned a, 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 an arc of discernment beginning with the panel discussion today. Um, UUJME is going to have their workshop on the issue this afternoon, I think at 1.15, and of course we'll debate and vote tomorrow. I wanted the delegates to participate in what I hoped would be a, a new way of discerning tough questions for us. And so I, um, unfortunately, our guests' comments triggered reactions from some of you, and I deeply regret that. And now please welcome Lisa Bover Kemper, Bover Kemper for the report. These hyphenated names are getting to me, you know? It's okay, just try spelling it on the phone. <laughs> you all know what I'm talking about. No, no, it's a hyphen in the middle. Good morning, friends. And thank you, Jim, for that apology. I know, we know at, at, on the right relationship team that that moment was challenging for many, and we are grateful for your words. Our first full day of General Assembly has been completed. Congratulations. You made it through the first full day. The Right Relationship Team has borne witness to fruitful conversation and engagement as we navigate conflict and hold space for so many identities, histories, and beliefs represented in this beloved community. We know that there are issues on the table at this General Assembly that are challenging, about which we all have deeply held opinions and beliefs, and about which we may not agree. The work of our faith, the work of this covenanted community, is to stay at the table when things get challenging. And I feel good about the ways that we are doing that at this General Assembly. I want to remind you again to take deep breaths, to be compassionate to one another, and to ask for help if you need it. We are here to help you engage with one another and to hold that table for all of us. Look, as always, for our orange shirts and bandanas. Drink your water and have a good day at GA. Thank you, Lisa. It is now my pleasure to welcome to the podium the president of our association, the Reverend Peter Morales, for his penultimate report to this delegate body. Peter? Penultimate. Well, good morning. Wow, what a start. The public witness, the amazing service of the living tradition. Uh, wow. I saw a fascinating piece of research. I often describe myself as a recovering social scientist, so I love these things, uh, about growing and declining congregations. It was a piece of research I saw a number of years ago. I've always been intrigued by why some congregations grow and others get smaller. So this study looked at a large number of factors across the nation. And things that I thought might make a difference, like the age and gender of the minister, made no difference at all. 
But one factor had the absolute opposite effect of what I would have guessed. Congregations that describe themselves as feeling like a close-knit family were more likely to be in decline. On the other hand, congregations that saw themselves as moral beacons in their community were likely to be growing. Now, I thought feeling like a close-knit family would be a positive thing. And a colleague pointed out that it's hard to join a close-knit family. On the other hand, congregations that were engaged in the moral issues of their communities attracted new members. When a congregation is too focused internally, it tends to shrink. And when it looks outward and is engaged and involved, it tends to grow. I think the same thing is true for each one of us. If we become preoccupied with ourselves and our immediate circle, we shrink spiritually. When we look beyond ourselves and beyond our immediate intimate circle, when we engage with our world, we come alive. Every great religious tradition teaches us that we truly find ourselves when we lose ourselves, when we lose ourselves in something greater. Unitarian Universalism has always been about engaging our world. We've always realized that we become our best selves in relationship. That's what covenantal theology is all about. And what is true for every one of us, what's true for our congregations is also true for our association. We're at our best when we reach out, when we engage, when we build relationships. When I think of what I'm most proud of over the seven years I have served as your president, it always has to do with forming partnerships that create new possibilities. I think back to our General Assembly in Phoenix, our Justice GA in 2012, our vigil just outside Sheriff Arpaio's infamous tent city prison is a precious memory to me. I still get emotional looking at the images. Were any of you there? All right. But what made that special? What made it possible? What made it possible were a lot of partnerships, partnerships among our congregations in Arizona, partnerships with local immigrant rights organizations like Puente, with the UUA district staff and the UUA national staff, and the national staff's partnerships with national organizations like the National Day Labor Organizing Network. That pattern of local and national partnerships has continued in our public witness. UU ministers and congregations in North Carolina work closely with the Reverend William Barber, president of the North Carolina NAACP, and other faith groups in the Moral Mondays movement. That ethic of being a good partner, often following rather than leading, extends to our work today with the movement for black lives and in climate justice. I'm so proud of our pioneering work in the entrepreneurial ministry training program. This is a unique and, yes, entrepreneurial program for religious professionals that brings in top business school faculty and religious innovators. This is just one of the programs that's been made possible because the UUA is partnering as it never has before with the UU Ministers Association and with business school faculty across the country. Our next challenge, and this is gonna be absolutely critical for us, is to take the most important lessons of this pilot program and make them available to all of our ministers and other religious professionals across the country. Next month at Star King School for the Ministry in Berkeley, we'll have the fourth summer seminary, a program for high school students who are considering a career as religious professionals. These young people are amazing and inspiring. Here's a photo of last year's group meeting in Denver. Nurturing their commitment is critical to our future. Guess what makes this innovative program possible? Right, partnerships 
among UUA staff in our seminaries and a number of congregations. Another way we're involving people of all ages and helping them engage our values in the world is with the UU College of Social Justice, a partnership with the UU Service Committee. The college provides immersion experiences in justice work and creates a context for crossing the boundaries of culture and class. Creating relationships to, continues to create new possibilities. Our growing presence in military chaplaincy provides support for military personnel from many faith traditions and for the growing number who identify with no religious faith. Sarah Lambert, our Director of Ministries and Faith Development Staff Group, is about to become the Chair of the National Conference on Ministry to the Armed Forces. You know, military ministry and chaplaincy has been dominated by conservative evangelicals for a number of years. And as you've already seen, we're forming stronger bonds with other faith traditions. We're exploring new ways of working together, not only to work for justice, but to reach out to the millions of spiritually homeless in America. We're not in competition with one another. We're in competition with fear, with ignorance, with greed, with racism, and with the banality of consumer culture. Relationships make us stronger, and relationships create new possibilities. None of the terrific work I've mentioned, and there's so much more of it, but none of this would have been possible for the UUA to do alone. It isn't just about being better together and stronger together, although that is certainly true. Relationships create possibilities. Relationships grow our souls. Now, I began by mentioning a study that showed that inward-looking congregations, congregations focused primarily on internal relationships, tend to decline. And congregations that look beyond their walls and beyond their immediate members tend to grow. They grow because they feed a deep hunger in the human spirit, because we are, after all, relational creatures. And so it is with our association. Yes, we're an association of member congregations. And yet, Unitarian Universalism has always been much, much more than a collection of congregations. We're the embodiment, the expression, the incarnation, if you will, of a religious vision of interdependence, of openness, of community. We are a living and evolving tradition. We're accountable to more than our current members, we're accountable to our history, to the future, to seekers who long for a spiritual home. As an association, we have to do two things simultaneously. First, we have to serve the needs of our members. We have to strive to be relentlessly useful, a phrase I've come to love, relentlessly useful. And that means we have to strive for excellence in everything we do that serves our members. Sometimes I feel like we're an electrical utility. We only notice an electrical utility when the grid goes down or when we get the monthly bill. So much of the essential work of your UUA staff is invisible unless something goes wrong. Here are just a few of the things we do that are usually taken for granted. We run a health insurance program that made health insurance available to same-sex couples when they could not get it locally. We manage the endowments for hundreds of congregations and do it in a way that is sound financially and socially responsible. We publish excellent educational materials for children, youth, and adults. And I want you to take a look at the new special seeker issue of UU World. It's a special issue that's going to be an outreach tool. It's hot off the press. I want you to Check it out at the InSpirit bookstore in the exhibit hall. And Skinner House and Beacon Press, I wish I had time, they just keep knocking it out of the park with their books. <laughs> you 
We're there every time there's a ministerial transition, and we do all kinds of consulting and training for volunteers and staff. The list goes on and on. We're also the national and international voice of Unitarian Universalism. We're your voice at the United Nations, in Washington, and in partnership with congregations all over this nation. Your UUA is also called upon to lead. In a time of unbelievably rapid change, this is vital. That's why we partner with other faiths, as you've seen, to explore how to engage the unaffiliated. It's why we develop a program like the one in entrepreneurial ministry. Unfortunately, the best work of our association is at risk going forward. If Unitarian Universalism is to thrive, if we're going to seize the amazing opportunities before us, we have to have a strong association. And if we're going to have a strong association in the future, we need to rethink how we fund it. We need to have an honest conversation among ourselves about what is fair for everyone. Sadly, the system we have now is not fair. Let me share some troubling numbers with you. This chart shows the total annual program fund requests, the fair share requests that we make of congregations, and the percent that is contributed. That solid line is the percent contributed. The most important element here is that the line that shows the amount of the ask that congregations give has dropped from the low 80 percent to 71 percent in a decade. That is about a million dollars a year. If, if we were giving at the same percent as a, 10 years ago, we would have a million more dollars to spend on essential and vital programs. Now, the drop isn't because congregational budgets have gone down. A decade ago, congregations gave 4% of their budgets. Today, that has dropped to 2.8%. And even more troubling to me is the fact that 47 congregations contributed, contributed nothing at all last year. 175 congregations contributed less than one quarter of the requested contribution, and 279 congregations, or 27% of the total, contributed less than half. That is simply unfair to everyone else. The administration and the Board of Trustees, along with leaders across the country, have begun a conversation about finding a better way to fund our work together. And I'd like to ask Mary Catherine Morn, who heads our stewardship and development staff, to speak to you about this effort. Thank you, Peter. After over 25 years serving as a minister in small, medium, and large congregations, I have experienced the joys and the challenges of congregational leadership. And it's true, sometimes I felt like we were out there all on our own, doing really good work, but not supported enough to realize our full potential. In fact, though I hope Peter never hears it, I sometimes complained about the UUA. Why weren't they doing it the way I would have done it? It's also true that in the midst of the ordinary and extraordinary of congregational life, I was often vividly aware of being held by all of you, congregations, staff, and leaders that are our UUA. Those times when I knew our work in the congregation was truly amplified because of our larger religious movement. And now, from this perspective, this seat in the House, I know this more than ever before. That is why we are working so hard to find the right way to fund our work. We're not at all unlike congregations in this work, trying to help you, our members, 
understand the importance of your financial support for our shared mission. In partnership with the board's APF task force, we are reaching out, some of you have received our survey already, for your input and your questions. Please let us hear from you. You can learn more about all of this on the UUA's webpage. We want to find a plan that brings us into right relationship, where we do not have to ask for too much, and you can give what is asked. We want all of our congregations to know we honor their contributions and neighboring contributions to see that the responsibility for funding our larger faith is shared in as equitable a way as possible. We know there have been difficult economic times. We know that the landscape of giving is shifting, and we want to be with you through all of this. And we are asking you to be with us and with each other differently now. We are asking that you prioritize your support of our congregations and our UUA through your giving to the APF and GIFT. When your congregation does this, the possibilities for our partnership will grow beyond what we have yet imagined. Let's make this a new beginning, a trusting, courageous, generous covenant. Thank you. Thank you, Mary Catherine. My own hope is that we reboot the whole thing that we ask for less money but get everyone to participate. It just seems a lot fairer to me. Now, none of this is going to take effect during my presidency, but let's get this fixed so that the next president, who will be the first woman president of the UUA, will <laughs> so that she has the resources to succeed. One of the joys of being president is working with a staff that is passionate and capable. You have a terrific staff, you really do. And I would like the UUA staff to uh, stand as they're able and be recognized right now. There they are, over there. As I enter my final year as your president, I'm as convinced as ever of the potential of our faith to feed the spiritually hungry and to be a blessing in a broken world. When we work together, we can do amazing things. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. The UU Service Committee is a UU-related organization that, while independent of the UUA, enjoys a very special relationship with the UUA. The Reverend Bill Schultz is the UUSC president that I'm pleased to introduce for his last presentation as UUSC president, and I think he may have an introduction to make as well. Bill? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, and good morning to you. Before I begin, I want to invite you to attend UUSC's gala tomorrow night, immediately following the Ware Lecture, where our guest will be Martin Luther King III. He will be speaking with me on the 50th anniversary of his father's address to the General Assembly. It's in it's in Batley South here in the Convention Center, and most importantly, dessert will be served. I hope you'll join us. This is, as Jim said, my sixth and final report to the Assembly on behalf of UUSC. On July 1st, I will be 
retiring both from UUSC and from full-time ministry. Whenever I tell people I'm retiring, they invariably ask, yes, but what's your next job? So I usually repeat, I'm retiring, and folks say, sure, we understand, but where will you be working? I got so frustrated that I decided to increase my teaching hours at Meadville Lombard Theological School and affiliate with the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard just so I could assure people that even though I'm no longer working, I still have a job. <laughs> of course, you know, to come to think of it, I've known a lot of people who had stopped working even though they still had a job. Recently, Recently, I stumbled upon a list of foreign phrases describing what people do in their retirement. This is what I should have been telling people, that I'll be kookaluring, for example, which means to sit and ponder without engaging in activity. I'll probably also do a bit of tivs making, which means to eat small pieces of food when you think nobody is looking. <laughs> tivs making sounds like a particularly pleasant thing to do. In any case, I'm retiring, and none too soon, because UUSC is in great shape, and I don't want to risk it going to the dogs on my watch, so I'm giving up the watch while giving is good. And when I say that UUSC is in great shape, I mean, for example, that we have raised just over $24 million in our fundraising campaign to double the amount of money we have available for helping people. I mean that for five years in a row, now five years, we have received a four-star rating from Charity Navigator, the highest you can get for efficient use of funds. I mean that we can now measure exactly how many people we are serving and for how much money. In Haiti, for example, our projects have improved the lives of 20,813 people at an average cost of $77, with more than 80,000 more the indirect beneficiaries of our work. I mean, I mean that our justice building program is revolutionizing the way we help local congregations become the most effective agents of change they can be. And I mean that we are touching the lives of Syrian refugees in Eastern Europe, immigrant women and children in Texas, earthquake survivors in Nepal and Ecuador, LGBTQ folks in Africa, and thousands and thousands more. It's all good, so I'm retiring. <laughs> and I, I could not be more delighted that while I will be kookaluring and tivs making, the organization's leadership will be in the hands of a devoted Unitarian Universalist, one of the most savvy social change strategists I know, and the next president of UUSC, who I want to introduce to you now, my dear friend, of more than 30 years, former Congressman Tom Andrews. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Bill. Congratulations on your retirement, and I think I speak for all assembled when we wish you the very best of Tibbs making in your next incarnation. But thank you, Bill Schultz, for the enormous contribution that you have made to the cause of human rights and social justice. For not being content to just talk the talk, but to walk the walk so powerfully and successfully. Thank you, Bill, for making our organization and indeed our world a much better 
and just place. I am deeply honored to be President-elect of the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee and somewhat daunted by the enormous shoes that I have been asked to fill. Since surviving a bout of cancer at age 16, I have been an activist for social justice and human rights. And I believe that there has never been a time, at least in my lifetime, that the mission and the values of the UUSC have been more desperately needed in our world. The stakes are so high for so many. Take global warming. The catastrophic consequences of years of unmitigated assault on our planet are being paid first and foremost by those who have had the least to do about it. They are the first in line to lose their land, to lose their water, to lose their health, to lose their livelihoods, to lose their lives. UUSC is standing with them and for them, not just as environmentalists, but as a gentle, angry people who are committed to environmental justice. And we are standing with and for those who are on the very bottom of a fundamentally unfair economic and political system that continues to generate grotesque disparities in income and opportunity. And we are standing with and for those who are most at risk during a humanitarian or a natural disaster, the most marginalized, the most forgotten. And when I think of the mission of the UUSC, I think of the words of the late Bobby Kennedy, who delivered a speech to a group of students in Cape Town during the darkest days of apartheid South Africa. He said this, it is from the numberless acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. Each time a man or a woman stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he or she sends forth a tiny ripple of hope and crossing each other from a million different centers, centers of energy and daring, those ripples build a current which can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. I am deeply honored and truly excited to be joining the UUSC and this community of gentle, caring, angry people who are willing to speak truth to power and to take action to advance the rights, the dignity, and the quality of life of all people, especially the most marginalized. But, but let's not just make ripples, as Bobby Kennedy suggested. Let's make waves. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bill, and a warm welcome to Tom Andrews. We look forward to partnering with you for our Justice Center GA in New Orleans next year. The UU Women's Federation was formed in 1963 by joining two previous women's organizations, the Association of Universalist Women, which was founded in 1869, and the Unitarian Women's Alliance, founded in 1890. Women in our UU movement have been speaking and acting on behalf of justice for women and girls for more than 150 years. They have never been more relevant than they are today, certainly, in an area, era when religious extremism and patriarchal attitudes uh, are eroding the rights of female-identified people on many fronts. Kirsty Lewis is its current board president, and I'm privileged and delighted to introduce her to her now. Christy.
Hello there. There seems to be a theme going on of people who are <laughs> retiring or leaving their positions. I need to tell you that this is also my last year as president of the UUWF. And um, I want to say to you, I have many things I want to talk to you about, um, about what the UUWF has been doing. And this is my last chance. <laughs> um, I want also to tell you that my father was a preacher, my mother was a teacher, so sometimes it's dangerous to put a microphone in front of me. I will try to stay on script, I promise. This year, the GA theme is Heartland, where faiths connect. It's appropriate for me to share with you the many ways in which the UU Women's Federation is connecting across our nation, across generations, across cultures and faiths. So we have many connections with UU women in the congregations and groups throughout our UU movement. We've increased our connections with um, expanding and developing our website and our Facebook presence. We send email blasts of our newsletter to more than 2,500 members of our community that is interested in and supporting our work. And we also create frequent and timely and passionate blogs, which are written by our affiliated minister, Reverend Marty Keller, and other guest bloggers. These posts keep us informed about current public policy regarding women's issues, cultural trends from Supergirl to Girl Scout cookie boycotts. I recommend that if you're interested, you go to our website and have a look at some of these passionate essays. At last year at GA in Portland, we offered a survey asking which women's justice issues most concerned UU women. The answers are not too unexpected, but they are reproductive justice, economic justice, and environmental justice. So as the board of UUF, WF, we are looking in those areas. We asked responders to our survey to describe their local women's groups and name UU ministers who promote women's justice issues in the pulpit and in their congregational focus. Recently, we shared two such exemplary women ministers in our online news. This is Reverend Leah Hart Landsberg and Reverend Amy Zucker Morgenstern. We invite more suggestions from you. Bridging the gap between UU ministerial professionals and lay women, we also reached out to UU female identified ministers in our new prophetic sisterhood project. This was created to provide a forum and resources for the benefit of nearly 150 women ministers who have connected with this project and who are signing on to a covenant of commitment prepared by the NPS Leadership Circle, Reverend Beth Dana and Reverend Marty Keller co-lead this ongoing project. We have also strengthened our connections with other UU groups, especially the UUA's Multicultural Growth and Witness Program. As illustrated by our partnership in financially supporting and working with the Clara Barton Intern for Women's Justice. Our current in intern is Shia French, who is aiming to do social justice advocacy and organizing with an expanding focus that includes anti-racism, homophobia, transphobia, classism, and ableism. I wish her well in her efforts. She is currently involved in efforts to promote reproductive justice, our recent UUA statement of conscience, throughout UU congregations. Another collaboration, which I'm very excited about, is with the UUA's Standing on the Side of Love campaign. This collaboration was approved by our board only a few days ago. In this joint project, the UUWF will provide 10 $1,000 stipends to women leaders in the Black Lives Matter movement. Okay. Our aim is for these funds to help defray the costs of childcare 
and care of dependent family members and the families of these women leaders so that they may participate more fully in the Black Lives Matter activist work. Yay. The UUWF also continues connections with other UU women's groups, such as the UU Women and Religion Group and the International UU Women's Convocation, which is holding its next major gathering in February of 2017. Now, beyond our connections with UU women, we are connecting to multi-faith and multicultural groups with shared interests in women's issues, women's justice issues. For many years, uh, we've been connected with other faith-based organizations, especially with the Reproductive Coalition for Reproductive Choice. Together with other groups, we have signed on to many interfaith amicus briefs written to protest the diminishment of women's rights, and including the Texas abortion clinic case, which was heard by the Supreme Court and which will be coming out with a further decision on Monday, we hear. We have made statements and joined many letters requesting continuing access to contraception under the Affordable Care Act, increases to the minimum wage, and an end to workplace discrimination against pregnant women. We are also working to strengthen our partnerships with secular groups that share our values and goals, and this has included connections with Sister Song, a group of women of color who are working towards reproductive justice for all women, including their Trust Black Women campaign and links to Black Lives Matter. Now this year, we focused on a large financial contribution to and advocacy efforts on behalf of Planned Parenthood in light of especially, especially vicious and deceitful efforts to shut it down. Yesterday, in our workshop, the UUWF honored the leaders of Sister Song, Monica Simpson, and, and the leader of Planned Parenthood, Cecile Richards, with our Ministry to Women Awards during our workshop. It was a rich and stimulating and wonderful workshop. I'm sure that many of you were there. Mm -hmm. We have recently made a strong connection also. We're talking about connecting across the generations. We've made a strong connection with Meadville Lombard Theological School. We are hoping that together we can create a cross-generational archive featuring the herstories you could say histories, but maybe it'll be both herstories, of our UU women's organizations and feminist UU leaders. We have been highlighting such leaders within our UUWF ranks by featuring on our, uh, the UUWR online publication of the Red Notebook of Lucille Longville, who was the primary author of the 1977 UU Women and Religion Resolution. We know there may be many people here who worked on that resolution. That urged UUs to examine the religious roots of sexism within our own denomination, and they did find some. <laughs> Knowing that we stand on the shoulders of our strong, committed foremothers, the UUWF created the Clara Barton Sisterhood to honor the women-centered work of living UU women over the age of 80 in congregations throughout the UU world. These three in the slides are newly honored members of the Clara Barton Sisterhood from Massachusetts. This is Emmanuel Minefield, Suzanne Murray, and Sarah Drury. Aren't they beautiful? We are also intent on deepening our intergenerational connections by administering the Marjorie Bowens Wheatley Scholarship Fund, which provides stipends for women of color at any age who are enrolled in UU ministry, music ministry, or religious education academic programs. This year's recipient, uh, no, she's not there yet. This year's recipient was Claudia Jimenez, and uh, this morning at the Meadville Lombard breakfast, I had a good conversation with the Meadville Long 
Lombard folks about how we can encourage more young women of color to apply for our scholarship program that honors Marjorie Bowens Wheatley. Many of you knew her. Right, the other way in which we are um, deepening our intergenerational connections is by funding what, we're, what we are calling a bad-ass convergence <laughs> of women, which is going to be held in fall of 19, 2017, excuse me, in the fall of 2017, which this event will focus especially on multi-generational, multicultural, and intersectional concerns that are compelling to today's women. Jessica Halperin, a current theological student and a prior Clara Barton intern of ours, has been commissioned to develop a two- or three-day event that will appeal to an all-generational group of women-identified leaders as we look ahead to emerging issues of fluid gender identity in the context of continued gender-based violence and discrimination. The UWF continues to be your leading voice within our faith movement in this country on behalf of women's justice. We are not yet a post-gender society. Sexism is real just as much as racism is real. Our vision is that an all-female identified people will be safe and free and whole. We ask you to join us in this work. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsty. Um, I like the timing of this next introduction following the presentation of UU Women's Federation. I'm very pleased to welcome to the platform and introduce to you a very special guest to this General Assembly, Rear Admiral Margaret Kibben. The 26th Chief of Navy Chaplains and the first woman to serve in this role. Chaplain, Chaplain Kibben will be presenting a workshop today at 1.15 on military ministry, free exercise and pluralism. So you might want to join her in uh, the Union Station Ballroom C. Unitarian Universalists have a lot to learn about interfaith ministry at its best from our military chaplains. And I thank Admiral Kibben and those who serve our nation in uniform. Our chaplaincy program under Reverend Sarah Lammert, Director of Ministries and Faith Development, is one that I'm very proud of and know you are as well. It's good to see our chaplains in uniform supporting the women and men who serve our country around the world. Thanks so much for being with us today. Before proceeding with our business this morning, um, I want to invite to the stage, and who made just a grand entrance here just a moment ago, our uh, attorney, Tom Bean. Um, he is a member of the Unitarian Society of Hartford. Uh, he's been our legal counsel and veteran of many general assemblies. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, he's a, a member of the First Unitarian Society in Newtown, Mass. I had wanted to introduce you to Justice Nina Elgo, She's a Superior Court judge in the state of Connecticut and a member of the Unitarian Society of Hartford. But she's been delayed with her plane arrival, so we expect her sometime this morning, and I will reintroduce you to her. So let me bring back Dr. Susan Geckler to report on the Congregational Study Action Issues, or CSAIs, as they are commonly known. Based on the results of the congregational poll that was done in February, the Commission on Social Witness submits the following issues from which delegates may select one for four years of study and action as a new Congregational Study Action Issue, or CSAI. 
You can see when the CSW alerts that was handed out this morning, the summary and the criteria for selecting a CSAI. The text of the CSAIs is found in your program books on pages 93 to 96. The issues that you will have a choice among are CSAI 1, which is climate change and environmental justice. Robert Murray will, is the proposer for that one. A national conversation on race. Deborah Greenwood is the proposer on that one. Ending gun violence in America. Mac Geckler is the proposer on that one. And the corruption of our democracy. Kendra Munson is the proposer on that one. And moderator Key will explain the process we'll go through. So now we're at that point in our agenda <clears throat> where we'll take action to decide on which of the four proposed congregational study action issues will appear in the final agenda tomorrow. So this is your cue to reach towards things like your voting cards and the program so you can follow along with us this morning. We're not going to vote for a while, but you need to have access to it. See bylaw section 412, Statements of Conscience, for a complete outline of the process. And I certainly hope you went to the many assemblies to weigh in on these. This is the first step in a process that will ultimately produce a Unitarian Universalist Association Statement of Conscience that emerges from one of these four CSAIs. You've heard the report on the four CSAIs under consideration. It is noted on page 11 of the Rules for Procedure the sponsor of each issue will have two minutes to speak in favor of the issue. The first proposed congregational study action issues eligible for referral to member congregations is found on page 93 of the program book and is entitled Climate Change and Environmental Justice. So will the chair of the Commission of Social Witness please introduce the sponsor? Well, she's not up here, so I will. Um, so the uh, sponsor of that is Robert Murphy. Uh, the, is he at the, uh, there he is. So the chair recognizes the delegate at the microphone one. Good morning, delegates. I am Bob Murphy from Tarpon Springs, Florida, Gulf Coast of Florida. We're concerned about climate change, but first of all, we're concerned about environmental justice because we don't want to solve environmental problems at the expense of people who already suffer in the energy economy. We're concerned about Native Americans, African Americans, Latinos, others who've already been victimized. We want to form new partnerships. We want to reach out of our silos. We want to try something new to build this environmental justice movement. And that means taking some risks, thinking about environmental issues in new ways. Because of this desire to work for new partnerships and to do things in new ways, I'm going to try something that's very unusual. I'm going to ask that you not vote for this issue. I'm going to withdraw my support, and I'm going to ask that you support the call for a discussion about racial justice. Okay. Now, environmentalists especially, if you're concerned about environmental justice, support the racial justice discussion. And next year, Come down to New Orleans and join me, and we'll have a discussion about racial justice, and we'll build that environmental justice movement. So you all come to New Orleans, and I'll take you out for a good cup of coffee. Thank you. Thank you. The second proposed congregational study action issue eligible for referral to member congregations is found on page 94 of the final agenda, and it's entitled A National Conversation on Race. 
Will the chair, uh, will um, uh, I recognize the, uh, the Deborah, I can't read the name, uh, Rosie Deborah Greenwood at microphone two. Thank you, Reverend Bob. <laughs> we must fight for racial reconciliation. Racial reconciliation occurs when we humans realize that we are more alike than different and that our common self-interests are more aligned than we have been led to believe. With racial reconciliation, we can overcome the superficial barriers that have diminished our power around all the issues we care about, climate change, gun control, Citizens United, mass incarceration, and more. We have common self-interests. If you are thinking, but we've already done our anti-racism work with our support of the Black Lives Matter movement, then you are exactly the person this CSAI is for. <laughs> you think you know our issues, but you haven't allowed others to help you with yours. Remember that arrogance Reverend Sinkford mentioned last night? What would our faith community be if it were more inclusive? Who might you be if you were in such a community? This conversation is designed to bring like and unlike people together, both within and without our congregations. In order to change the world, we need allies, we need partners. And we need to begin the process of developing those relationships. I'll leave you with a quote from Nelson Mandela, who makes the ask for your support far better than I. We understand that there is no easy road to freedom. We know it well that none of us acting alone can achieve success. Thank you very much. Thank you. The third proposed congregational study action issue eligible for referral to member congregations is found on page 95 of your program book and entitled Ending Gun Violence in America. I recognize Mac Guckler at microphone three. I'm a delegate from Davies Memorial U Church in Camp Springs, Maryland. I want to thank those off-site delegates for their input and also the input we got from the mini assembly. It was very helpful. 33,000 33,000 gun deaths a year. One third of those are homicide, murders. There are a few that are supposedly accidental, but they're not really accidental. Two thirds, 22,000 suicides a year. 22,000. I've lost five friends and colleagues to suicide. The commonalities are none were elderly, none had terminal disease, all had handguns, and that's how they went. We need to do something about that. In your CSW alert, you will notice that on the list of all the CSAIs we've done, and SOCs, gun violence does not appear. It is time we take this issue on. There's much we can do. We need to listen. We need to learn. We need to get behind and support programs that are working. Domestic violence issues, suicide intervention, we need to keep guns away from those people who shall not have guns. Thank you. Thank you. The fourth proposed congregational study action issue eligible for referral to congregations and is um, 
on page 96 of your program book. And I recognize Kendra Munson at the uh, microphone four. Good morning, my name is Kendra Muntz. I'm from the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Venice, Florida, and our Florida Statewide Action Network, UU Justice Florida. Our fifth principle calls us to champion democracy. Now we must address the corruption that underlies all issues. We will never solve gun violence, racism, and climate change until we get the big money out of control of government. How long must we suffer mass murders like the one in Orlando while Congress is enthralled to the NRA? How long will legislators deny climate change because they are funded by the fossil fuel industry? How long will our bloated campaign finance system consume outrageous sums of money while workers fight for 15, women fight for control of their own bodies, and LGBTQ folks fight for their basic human rights? Enough! Let's explore all ways to fix our broken system of government. Yes, we must address mass incarceration, white supremacy, voting rights, gerrymandering, and public financing of campaigns. We need a moral political revolution, a fusion coalition to work together for respect and dignity for all. Thank you, Reverend Barber, for leading us forward together, not one step back. And yes, to get big money and hate messaging out, we must do more than overturn Citizens United. We must go to the root of problems and eliminate corporate constitutional rights and money as speech. The Constitution was for we the people, not we the corporations. Let's work together to restore that promise. 22 UU congregations in Florida have passed a resolution for the 28th Amendment. Yours can too. 700 resolutions and ballot initiatives have passed in cities and counties all over the country. New York just became the 17th state to pass a resolution. Washington state votes in November. California may be next. Will you join this critical effort? Let's explore all avenues for fixing our broken system. Let's start with voting at all levels. And yes, amend the Constitution if needed. Please vote for CSA proposal number four, the corruption of our democracy. Let's stop the madness. Let's solve this for all our issues. Thank you. Thank you. So you have heard from the sponsors of the four proposed CSAIs. And now we have time for up to four additional statements of support for each of the issues. I have been advised that we have no one off-site that wants to speak to the issues, so let me suggest a way we're going to do this. Uh, CSA 1 has essentially uh, deferred, if you will. So we will be hearing first from microphone 2 a national discussion on race. And we're going to do them all through the, and then the second group and then the third group. So I recognize the delegate at microphone number two. Good morning, I'm Ed Edelson from the Mattituck Unitarian Universalist Society of Woodbury, Connecticut. Why do we need a conversation on race now? Many of us had hoped that the election of Barack Obama almost eight years ago would lead to a more mature awareness of race in the United States. We heard words like a post-racial society. Instead, with cruel irony, we found ourselves in an era of heightened racism. Elected leaders at the highest levels vowed to do all they could do to stop any initiative of the new president and work for his failure. That's outrageous. This is not typical partisan rhetoric, but the words supported by many of racial hatred. It did not take long for it to lead to the fear, hatred, violence, and mass incarceration. President Obama chose to focus on getting his work done by ignoring the issue of race in order that he could keep the nation uh, to address the great economic recession he inherited or the dec and to focus on the decades-long struggle to address the 40 million people without health insurance or forging worldwide agreements on climate change. But it was at the cost of postponing the important conversation on race that this country needed to continue and now needs more than ever if we're going to be able to continue to bend the arc of history towards justice. That is why I speak in favor of this CSAI, so that UUA delegates can show our support for addressing the heightened racism that is not only immoral, but undermines our nation and its role in the world. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at microphone two. Good morning. 
My name is Joanne Weiss, and I'm with the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Gwinnett in Lawrenceville, Georgia. Perhaps for some people, the first impression of the CSAI is, the, is that we are already doing the work on racial justice. Our congregations have displayed banners, read books, attended protests, and lit up Facebook with comments. We feel that we are moving forward. The missing piece, however, is listening to each other and having difficult conversations so that we may truly know each other as we have so much to learn from one another. We must work towards transformative change and true reconciliation. This is the goal of this CSAI. Last year, we voted to support Black Lives Matter through, an act, or through our act of immediate wit, of, action of immediate witness. This CSAI is a deepening of that support. A national conversation on race is the foundation of how we continue to engage in our work on racial justice. In addition, I support this CSAI, CSAI because I like the practicality of the local focus. It engages us within our congregation and encourages us to meet with our neighboring faith communities in a way that we listen and learn from, another, from one another so that we can create a more compassionate world. I ask you to vote for a national conversation on race. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at microphone number two. Good morning, I'm Jackie C. Williams from the First Unitarian Universalist Society of Albany, New York. Last night, for those of us who attended the service of the living tradition, Reverend Singford talked about the service of the living tradition in 1966 and the Ware Lecture speaker, who was Dr. Martin Luther King. At that time, the UA was asked not to sleep through the revolution and was given all kinds of reasons and was given some step-by-step -step things that could have been done. Reverend Singford reminded us, those of us of a certain age, and for those who were born later, about the assembly and association excitement, interest, and support of those steps, and what could have been done that later was talked about as the journey toward wholeness. In the last few years, we've been celebrating a number of 50th anniversaries. We've talked about merger of the UUA. We've talked about civil rights bills. We've talked about events like the March to Selma and even what most refer to as the black walkout. To reconcile truths, plural, must be told. An uncomfortable and inconvenient truth regarding race is that this, in this nation is that we have again reached a crisis moment in time. When change must happen, people considered different or other have been dying or injured with impunity. As much as we Unitarian Universalists may believe that we do affect the entire world, what we believe and how we feel, in fact, in the 60s, 80s, 90s, and even in this century, is not new, as you've heard. However, it is essential. Reverend Sinkford did say we failed. And I repeat, many of the resolutions, AIWs, and previous CSAIs have included race. However, the work is not done. Reverend Barber talks about it being a moral movement and being part of a fusion movement. All of us have race. We need a better... <laughs> I recognize the delegate at microphone number two. Good morning. I'm Connie Cole Ingber from Mattituck Unitarian Universal Society in Woodbury, Connecticut. So talking about what are the signs that this conversation on race is the CSII for right now, Dr. Deborah Greenwood's passion and eloquence brought our attention to this need for a very necessary conversation on race. We as a faith are at a tipping point. Yesterday, we were electrified by the words of Reverend William Barker, then further inspired by Reverend Singford. I cannot count how many times yesterday, in this room and in others, we were on our feet driven there by the truth being told, by the truth we each heard and felt in our bones and hearts. This conversation is already begun, and we as Unitarian Universalists can only benefit from taking up this conversation on race, congregational study action issue. 
The message of this General Assembly thus far has been, the time has come for each of us to galvanize our congregations, to put our shoulder to the wheel and bend that arc toward justice. Remembering that we are stronger together, that refusing to be divided by race is key to success in this battle for racial justice, building bridges instead of walls will deliver us to the goal that seems impossible at times, freedom and equality for all. Voting for this CSAI, for this conversation on race, could be the key to our movement forward. We who have been awoken can share the power and determination we have found here at General Assembly with others at home, and this CSAI will give us the tools to do just that. I remind you of the blessing we shared with one another yesterday. I put my hand in yours so that we may do together what I cannot do alone. Thank you. And now we turn to microphone three, where proponents of the uh, ending gun violence in America, and I recognize the delegate at microphone number three. Good morning. My name is Morgan Johnstone from Arlington Street Church in Boston. I was born and raised in Louisiana, and in Louisiana and the South in general, guns and gun laws and the NRA are rampant. There's no protection. The crisis and the horrible thing that happened in Orlando, Florida just a few days ago scared me. It scared me so I didn't want to run out, leave my house. I didn't want to hold my partner's hand in public. I am scared for my brothers and sisters in the LGBT community in the South. We have no protection. What happened in Orlando could happen again unless we do something about it. I urge the congregation, I urge the delegates to vote for this CSAI. And if we do this, I think we can make a change in not only the UUA, but in the country and world as a whole. Thank you. Thank you. I recognize the second of four delegates to be speaking at microphone three. I recognize the delegate at microphone three. I am Eleanor Halper, delegate from the Oberlin, Ohio UU Fellowship. And, uh, at the 2004 Long Beach uh, GA, I led the effort to pass an AIW seeking to renew the then ban on assault weapons. The AIW passed GA unanimously, but Congress did not renew the ban. Assault weapons now are the most used weapons in mass shootings. I became active in seeking sensible gun laws after May 9, 2003. Why? On that day, a disgruntled graduate from Case Western Reserve University forced his way into a building, shot discriminately using an assault weapon and a pistol. He killed one student, wounded another, and wounded a professor, while 92 terrified students, faculty, and staff desperately tried to find places to hide. That professor was my daughter, is my daughter. She heard the gunshots, returned to her office, turned and saw the gunman six feet away. She slammed her office door closed just as he shot what would otherwise have been a lethal bullet through the door. She realized she could be seen uh, through the translucent glass, so, so she hid in the closet for the next four hours, standing the whole time. Before the gunman was caught, a SWAT team rescued her, led her out of the building, covered her escape with raised rifles, shown in a widely published dramatic photo of a terrified woman, my daughter. Her chest wound was not serious. The bullet hit her sternum and bounced off. But what if it had been a half an inch to one side? Her PTSD lasted five years, despite skilled counseling and her husband's support. She managed her teaching load, but her research suffered greatly. But no one remembers this 13 years ago, only one death. But those, those present that day remember, and their families and friends. I call on all you use. Thank you. I recognize the uh, third delegate at microphone three to speak on gun violence. Good morning. My name is Eric Svensson from First Parish Unitarian Universalist in Lexington. I'm here with a little my closer to the mic. 
let, let's start the clock over again. Oh, it hadn't started yet. Good. Um, I am Eric Svensson. I am with First Parish Unitarian Universalist in Lexington, Massachusetts. I'm here with my son who co-wrote this statement. Gun violence in America is a problem of, ep of epidemic proportions. 33,000 gun deaths every year, 90 every day. Gun possession is no longer a constitutional matter for Congress. It's a matter for our society. When black people are 10 times more likely to be killed by guns than white people, this is an issue of race and equality. When Americans are 25 times more likely to be murdered with a gun than in any other developed country, this is an issue for our culture. When 50% of suicides are committed with handguns, this is a public health issue. Race, suicide, domestic violence, and poverty are intrinsically connected to gun violence, and we can no longer ignore how it has affected our communities. Nor can we wait for our national government to solve the problem. The NRA would have us believe the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun, when the truth is very different. Less than 1% of violent crime is prevented with a gun. Gun possession is not providing personal safety. In fact, it is very much the opposite. Gun owners are four and a half times more likely to be shot by a gun. The clear difference in our perception and the reality shows that our country needs to seriously examine the role that guns play in providing security. If our goal is truly a world community with peace, liberty, and justice for all, we need to focus on a free and responsible search for that truth and meaning within this issue. We have an opportunity and an imperative as Unitarian Universalists to begin that examination and dialogue within our communities and our congregations. We can break this cycle of guns leading to violence, leading to more guns, and shape the narrative from one of fear to one of healing from the scars left on the fabric of our society. We urge you to support this CSAI. Thank you. I recognize the last delegate at microphone three to speak on gun violence. Good morning. I'm Lee Meyer from First Unitarian Church, Cincinnati, and I am here to support the proposed CSAI on gun violence. Understand, if our current rate of genocide continues, most of the other issues we're concerned about won't really matter. We live in the most violence-afflicted peacetime society in the world. Comparative statistics from a number of sources reveal a disproportionate level of deaths from gunshots in the USA. A report last week in USA Today showed a level of gun-related fatalities here that is 160% higher than that in the UK, a much more densely populated country. A Wikipedia report shows US deaths from gunshots at 105 per million population compared with less than nine per million in Australia and two per million in the UK. If you are black, you are 10 times more likely than a white to die from guns in the United States. We know the rate of incidence of mass shootings is accelerating in this country. Recent police shootings from Ferguson to Chicago and all around Ohio have urbanites and suburbanites, especially people of color, living in fear of the very public servants who are supposed to protect them. Many, many of us believe that our gun culture has not made us safer. It has made us more vulnerable. But now, with attention drawn to the escalation of gun-related events, the time for us to support serious study of the proliferation of deadly weapons in our society and the cultural and political inertia that sustains it is here. If Donald Trump is wrong when he states that we will be safer when all good Americans own their own assault rifles to defend themselves, then we need to be compiling the evidence to support our position. This is the time to Thank work on it. Thank you very much. And the um, four delegates uh, speaking for CSI 4 on corruption of our democracy, I recognize the delegate at the microphone. Thanks. My name is Jasper Davidoff, and I'm a member of the Church of the Larger Fellowship from Evanston, Illinois. 
Okay, it didn't start yet. Okay. As a youth, <laughs> as a youth, I want to imagine that I know what youths are interested in. So I think that as a congregational study, the corruption of our democracy gives us a special opportunity right now to engage more people in our congregations. It's being proposed during a year in which I've watched my friends and fellow teens get more interested in politics and policy than I've ever noticed before. We're turning out in droves to support candidates who are actually making an effort to speak to us. We're volunteering for them. We want a stake in our country. We want a national voice more than ever before. And we've been expressing discontent this year as well. My friends in college at the University of Wisconsin, for example, are infuriated that their state-issued photo IDs won't permit them to vote. Many of us have been displeased with the system that with powerful corporate funding, superdelegates, and closed party registration periods, seems like it's trying to silence our voices. And when our elected officials and representatives insult the refugees that we've befriended at school, or refuse to deal with the gun epidemic that caused the empty seat at my high school's graduation this year, we want to imagine that our votes and our organizing efforts can make a difference. Just this year, 400 of us UUs joined 1,400 people arrested this year in DC for Democracy Spring and Democracy Awakening. There's something going on. So let's talk about voting rights, special interests in gerrymandering, because we have opinions too. We want to improve the system so we can feel like our passion translates to actual change. If our, corporations, uh, if our congregations begin to have conversations about how to rebuild our democracy, we'll join in, and having more youth in the conversation is always a better thing. So please, let, vote to let us by supporting CSAI number four, The Corruption of Our Democracy. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. I spot a proud grandmother out there. <laughs> Just saying. I recognize the delegate at the microphone. Thank you. I am Gladys Sanchez. I represent Unitarian Universalist Fellowship of DeKalb in DeKalb, Illinois. To, to my fr proud African-American seven-year-old son, I am a strong Filipino woman who serves as both his mother and father. To many rich middle-class white guys with Fortune 500 companies, I am identified as an illegal alien, low-income, single mother that should not complain and accept cheap labor or de be deported back to the country I left at the age of seven. To my close UU friends in this room, I am a college graduate, balancing three jobs and serving as a director of religious educator at my home church. The democracy I envision should simply identify me as a taxpayer human being. How is it that even with a college degree, I still have to juggle three jobs and still live at the poverty rate? Is it democracy to put me in a category in which I run the risk of going back to my country I left at seven or be treated as a second-class citizen? Is it fair, equal, or just to have a single minority mother like myself make 79 cents for every dollar earned by men when I am the head of the household? My dear friends, in order for us to work together towards a dem democratic society, we must reframe, recreate, and revitalize our definition of a fair, just, democratic society. This is the time to invest in restoring our democracy so we can truly serve our people. Our goal in moving forward supports grassroots organization movements as they organ organically form from the bottom up. The corruption of our democracy is the meta issue that needs to be dealt with first. It is directly connected to two of our UU principles, which is first, to, direct, to respect the inherent worth and dignity of every person, and fifth, which is the right of conscience and use of the democratic process. With Thank you very much. I recognize the delegate at microphone four. Good morning. My name is Alan Lindrup. I'm a delegate from the First Unitarian Society of Chicago. In line with our fifth principle, I urge you to vote for proposal uh, Congressional Study Action Issue number four, is that it has multiple aspects worthy of study and action. That's why a four-year process is needed. Plus, it is timely. 
in that progress on many of the issues will be affected uh, by how much, we can, how much we can accomplish on other issues is affected by how much we can progress on this. Studying and acting to move our country toward a constitutional amendment to overturn the Supreme Court's Citizen United decision versus advancing a court challenge before a Supreme Court with a new makeup is one of the focuses. Studying and acting to move our home states away from procedures that create gerrymandered and non-competitive congressional and state legislative districts is another. Fighting measures that try to restrict who can vote and working to make our making accessible voting for as many citizens as possible is yet another. Join us in voting to help restore the democracy that is the foundation of people power. Vote for CSA I number four, the corruption of our democracy. Thank you. I recognize the delegate at microphone four. Thank you. I'm Reverend Dr. Michelle Walsh, and I'm an affiliate community minister with and a delegate for the United First Parish Church in Quincy, Massachusetts. I am passionate about addressing climate change, racial justice, and gun violence in this country and our larger world. As an urban community minister, I have seen far too many black children I have loved and helped to raise die from gun violence including my African-American goddaughter's nephew, Kenny Hall. As a queer, bi-affectional person, person, I feel heavily the traumatic impact of the most recent mass shooting in Orlando on the LGBTQ communities. I also fear for the impact of climate change on current and future generations, such as my nieces, nephews, and goddaughter and god-grandchild in the coming decades as well as the impact and burden already being carried by the most oppressed and marginalized communities as they experience droughts, hurricanes, tsunamis, and rising sea levels with all of the negative political consequences in the aftermath. This is why I have chosen to speak on behalf of studying for the next four years our corrupted democratic process and how we can empower ourselves to make this process equitable and just for all persons. I desperately want and need each person to have a voice and capacity for action in this country because each of these issues and so many more are needed to create the more beloved and flourishing world we dream about. Issues that include severe economic and educational inequality, mass incarceration, xenophobia, inadequate health and mental health care. The intersection of all of these issues requires a moral fusion of communities of resistance to increase our capacity for action. It requires us to deepen into understanding how we have progressively lost our democracy to oligarchy in this country. It requires us to study how we can regain our democracy by changing the system. It requires us to act. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, you have heard the delegates speaking in support of these four CSAIs to which one to bring to the final agenda. Now it's time to vote. Now let me explain the voting card each delegate should have by now. It will be used to vote for a CSAI today and an AIW tomorrow. So you've got two voting activities on that one card. And I want you to use only the bottom stub and enter a number that represents the CSAI you wish to support. It's pretty clear, but let me state it more so. If you wish to vote for CSAI 1, despite the magnanimity of the, the proposer, you may still vote for CSAI 1 on um, climate change and environmental justice. Write a 1 in the box. If you want to support 2, a national conversation on race, write 2 in the box. If you want to support three, ending gun violence in America, write three in the box. I think you're getting it now. And if you want to support four, corruption of our democracy, write four in the box. Then detach it from your voting card and pass it to the tellers, which are standing by. And again, you can recognize them by those great vests they wear. These ballots will be counted while we do the rest of our business. And if one does not have a plurality, we will have a, a runoff uh, when we know the results. 
Now, occasionally, someone will vote for more than one, and they write two numbers in there. If you write more than one number or number five or higher, your ballot will not be counted. You only get to vote for one. I know they all have merit, and they really do all have merit, but you only get to vote for one. So now the tellers will collect and count the ballots, and we'll announce the results by the end of this general session. We good? I think it's time to sing, don't you? And um, I'm looking who our music leader is this morning, and I believe it's going to be Sarah Dan Jones, a good friend and incoming trustee on the UUA Board of Trustees. Good morning. Good morning. Ah, oh, right. Find a voice, find our stillness. It's so good to be here with you all. I'd like to invite you to sing an old hymn from Singing the Living Tradition in the Spanish translation created by Reverend Lilias Cuerva from Las Voces del Camino. The original text, Find a Stillness, is by Carl Seberg. It's an old Transylvania hymn tune. The new Spanish setting is Busca Calma. My friends, I invite you to rise in body and spirit and sing with speck and I. Thank you, you're beautiful. You may have a seat. Thank you, I like that. I'm not sure what the favorite things about general session are for you, whether it's the music or the reports or the, the debates, they're all good. But for me, I like the music. Um, so thank you. I want to introduce the delegates to a new way of discerning complex issues. I spoke to it a little bit this morning. Before we have to debate and vote on them, depending on what your reactions will be and the surveys that follow this general session, uh, we'll expand that as we go forward. You use for justice in the Middle East have secured the necessary signatures required by our bylaws to bring a business resolution to this general assembly. It's for the delegates to embrace or reject. It has been perfected and distributed to you this morning, and that'll be the basis of the uh, mini-assembly this afternoon to make amendments to that as, you, as the delegates see fit. As this business resolution has moved through the process for presentation to the delegates, the Socially Responsible Investment Committee has been concurrently doing their job of renewing holdings in the Common Endowment Fund. In this role, they have been utilizing the services of Sustainalytics, which applies screens based on criteria 
directed by the Socially Responsible Investment Committee, guided by votes of General Assembly delegates and the UUA board. The most recent such screening resulted in the elimination of certain holdings which did not pass the Sustainalytics Human Rights Screen. There was no vote taken by the board or the investment committee with regard to divestment, but rather the usual balancing of the fund in the usual course of the committee's work. So we are now at a place where the business resolution as presented uh, in the program book has been modified by the handout that you got this morning in conjunction with council. You use for justice in the Middle East, the makers of this business resolution, have modified the language to reflect this new reality, and that will be what will be uh, discussed this afternoon in the mini assembly. It will be held at 445 in Union Station Ballroom C. So those of you who want to influence the language of this business resolution should plan on being there. It is not the place to debate the pros and cons. That will be here tomorrow. With that as a backdrop, I want to invite five people to the stage. Donna Ashrawi, member of the First UU Church of Houston. Farrell Brody, member of the First UU Church of Columbus. He didn't drive far. Denny Davidoff, member of the Unitarian Church in Westport, Connecticut. The Reverend Jay Woolen, minister at the UU Congregation of the Quad Cities in Davenport, Iowa. And John Saruf, principal of Public Conversations Project in Watertown, Mass. The Public Conversations Project fosters constructive con conversations where there is conflict driven by differences in identity, beliefs, and values. And so I've invited John to facilitate a conversation among these four people with different views on the business resolution to help the delegates understand the complexities of what you're being asked to support or oppose. And frankly, I also want to model a better way of discerning how we you use live out our values in a complex world that challenge competing values or put us at odds with each other and frankly may be difficult to reduce to a simple yes or no, pro or con. So John, I invite you to facilitate this conversation. I think we're all eager to hear it. Thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you for making this important space. Thank you all for being here. The Public Conversations Project is honored to be a part of this important conversation, one that we know carries with it a lot of feelings and convictions that understandably run deep. We know that behind every belief is a story, and that behind every story is a person. Can we, in our deliberations over the most important decisions, hear each other's stories? Can we see each other as people? And even across the great differences that divide us, can people stay in community and continue the important work that they want to do together? The debate will happen. It will happen tomorrow. And it will continue, no doubt. This is an opportunity to model a different kind of engagement, a different kind of discernment, to be advocates in relationship with other advocates, remaining curious and willing to engage. And that is what our four guests have volunteered to do today, and we are grateful to them for their willingness to share so openly in such a public way. And all of them have agreed to keep to the time limits that we'll have so that everybody can be heard equally, to allow people to speak uh, without being interrupted, to refrain from trying to convince other people on stage to change their position, to critique positions and not the people themselves, and to speak on behalf of themselves and not on behalf of some group. So I'm going to just start by asking you, Jay, and each person will have three minutes to answer. Can you speak of an experience you've had that will help people understand how you came to your views on the issue of how to decide whether the UU should hold investments 
related to human rights issues in the Palestinian territories, and maybe speak about a core value that informs your discernment? Certainly, thank you. And thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I was born and raised in the uh, Reformed Jewish tradition, and the experience that informs me is anti-Semitism of, of my family and of the Jewish people. Um, my grandparents, who were born in Lithuania, beaten, house burnt down, forced to leave Lithuania to come to America, um, and thankfully, because otherwise, all likelihood, they might have died in the Holocaust. Um, to my uh, and forced then when they came to America to work uh, in you know just whatever they could do to earn money. Uh, my parents, my father, uh, one child of, of five sisters, they all saved to send him to college. And his opportunities, what colleges he could go to, were limited, as he was excluded from many colleges because of his religion. What jobs he could get were limited because of his religion. And then myself, prior to going into ministry, uh, I was in the business world. Uh, many times I myself was subjected to uh, being called a kike, being told, drew them down, even though they knew I was a Unitarian Universalist. But you see, just because I, I was born and raised, they attributed uh, the same anti-Semitism, the same discrimination that they were raised to believe in. And so, and as well, I think about my local temple where I live in Iowa, has to have police guards every service because they, are, they have swastikas put on their temple, they have threats on an ongoing basis. And so the value that I present that really informs me about this is refuge that the state of Israel is a place of refuge for Jewish people who have been historically oppressed, who have been thrown out of countries, thrown out of their own country, first by the Babylonians and then by the Romans. And then as the diaspora went, they were excluded from country to country, even ones they were very highly integrated in. And so they made their way back to the historic homeland and then uh, even before World War II, and after the Holocaust, that, that just increased. And then after, of course, the creation of the State of Israel, uh, other Jews now from our surrounding areas in, in the Arab world and as well in Africa and even farther, even America, uh, they know it is a place of last refuge that they can go to, a Jewish homeland. Uh, where, where they will stand up for themselves and will not sacrifice themselves uh, for, and be a scapegoat for others' discrimination. Thank you. This Thank you, for, Jay. For three minutes. For three minutes, Farrell. Okay. Um, I understand this is a difficult one for a lot of people. I don't know if you've read the resolution. Uh, this is a very beautiful resolution, in my opinion. First, as a Jew, I have to say that most of my life I've tried to live up to what I believe is the best in Judaism, which is called tikkun olam, fixing of the world, not destroying the world, not subjugating people, not occupying, building for the future, for the people of, this, of our species, for all of our species, and for the planet. So this resolution represents me as a Jew. As a UU, everything I believe in, in our seven principles, is really here, especially the parts that talk about our compassion, our, our desire for equity in human relations. All of that is meaningful to me as an individual, as a Jew, as a UU. When I look at the companies involved in this resolution, they are not interested in my Jewish ethics. They are not interested in my UU ethics, my UU beliefs. They're interested in money, and I would call it blood money, because what they are getting is money 
from an occupation of Palestinians. Farrell, I'm, yes. I'm just I wonder if we can just call you back to that, the value and where, where, you, where that comes from that for comes you. That comes from several places. One is that in 1957, I was driving a Caterpillar tractor on a kibbutz and right up to the edge of the Gaza Strip is where I was, where I was working, across on the other side of that little ditch that separated Israel from what was then Egypt were poor Palestinian farmers. I recognized immediately the incredible imbalance of power that even existed then, and of course I feel still exists today. And one more, in 1963, I ask a very wise man, what can be done about this situation? And he said to me, what do you want to do about this situation? Are you just going to talk about it? Are you going to work to do something? And I said, thank you, Dr. Buber. It was Martin Buber who told me to do something. And so from that moment on, I realized that that's what I had to do in this situation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Farrell. <laughs> Demi, I was born in March of 1932 to educated parents who were first generation Americans, the children of Ashkenazi immigrants from Eastern Europe, Ukraine, Poland, Latvia. My extended family childhood in the beachside community in Queens, New York, was middle class, conservative Jewish, New Deal political, and materially safe. But the Nazi Wehrmacht, the plight and death of family members in Europe, the Holocaust, World War II, and the need for establishing a Jewish homeland in Israel were always the dominant themes in my home, in the Temple Bethel Religious School, at family and community gatherings. My dad, worked with the PTA to undo the influence on kindergartners and first graders at public school 114, whose teachers were disciples of Father Coughlin and Gerald L. K. Smith and their America First movement. My dad and his friends from the Temple Bethel men's group raised money for the Haganah. I learned early on to always be able to identify the people who were I ever in danger because I was a Jew could be counted on for unconditional help. The barricades, we used to call it, among my cousins. So I am a birthright Zionist. Zionism is in my bones and in my soul. I believe in the right of the Jewish people, my Jewish people, to have an undisputed homeland in Israel. Thank you, Denis. Appreciate it. <laughs> Dana? Good morning. I, um, I was sensitized since birth to the UU principle of respect for the inherent worth and dignity of all human life and to the core value of love and action. I'm a third generation UU and the Reverend Theodore Parker is in my family tree. 
I was very proud to hear as a child of his courage in being part of a minority of clergy who spoke out against slavery. My grandmother, Edith Parker, modified a Unitarian covenant to be the dinnertime grace, and we still say it today on occasion, love is the spirit of this home and service is its law, to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love, and to help one another. I came home from elementary school one day with my first ethnic joke and proceeded to tell it to my mother, the daughter of Polish immigrants. It did not go well. <laughs> But using her UU values, she gently educated me that we do not tell ethnic jokes because they're hurtful, and furthermore, don't you dare laugh at them ever. So sensitized to these values, I eventually met my life partner, Ibrahim, who happened to be a Palestinian, and oddly, very much like my father, who was not Palestinian. Together, we raised three children who have benefited from many UU affiliations and I've had the privilege to visit Israel as well as the occupied Palestinian territories twice, West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem, such a beautiful land, dynamic people, deep history, and so much oppression. I've also been to South Africa during apartheid, and I see in that time and place and the visits that I made denial of dignity in different ways. I saw military checkpoints blocking access to normal life, I think 500 or so in a place the size of Maryland. Um, very unnerved to see armed soldiers very much present. It was very intimidating to me. Um, horrified that a relative with a medical emergency had to go from one ambulance to another at a checkpoint, which is very routine. And this same relative was forced to kneel in the hot sun for four hours on a sidewalk because he refused to get his ID out immediately for a soldier's perusal. I saw Palestinian homes that were bulldozed by military orders because one member of the family had been arrested. The whole family was made homeless. And this just really disturbed me deeply. Um, so these are the experiences that have informed me to be the person I am today that feels that we need to not profit from companies that enable the types of human rights abuses that I have seen. Thank you, Dana. Oh. So these issues are complex. Can you speak about ways that you feel pulled in multiple directions about this question, either because of competing values or because of the relationships you have? And because we're limited in time, I'm going to ask you each to speak for about one minute in ways, about ways in which you feel sort of pulled in different directions about this. Can I start with you, Jay? Sure. So, of course, there, there is human suffering. I mean, the Palestinians are, are suffering as a people, and, and that pains me, and it does. Um, I don't agree with many of the actions of the Israeli government, uh, their expansion of the settlements, and so um, I struggle with that as well. And yet my goal is how do we find peace so that both Israelis, both Jewish and Arab Israelis, um, can know that they can live in peace where uh, leaders of the Palestinians have um, consistently over the years uh, called for the destruction of the state of Israel. And so how do we balance that against the needs of, of the people who are suffering? And how do we find peace? Ultimately that is the question is how do we find peace without punishment of, of a people? Great. Thank you. Yeah I, yeah, I understand. I really think it's, that's I feel much the same way. Um, and I, I know how difficult this resolution is for Denny and for Reverend Jay. But it's not an anti-Semitic, it's not an anti-Jewish resolution. If anything, it's anti those companies that are carrying out what I feel is something that is really against 
my principles as a Yuyu and as a Jew. So I'm caught, you know, feeling and understanding what, what they are saying, hoping that we can both end up working for the same thing in the future. Uh, because our church, you know, our church is worth more. It's, it's more valuable than what these companies are doing. We're worth more than that. We're better than that. Okay. And, and that's a struggle for me to understand uh, some of the things that are Thank you. opposed to the resolution. Thank you. Thank you. Denise? I wrote down pretty much what Jay had said, but I've just sat here and had, I think, an amazing insight learned from my grandson who spoke to see the CSI mm. on corporate on, on what corporations are doing to us as a culture, all of us, to our country, Citizens United and, and, and all of that. And, and what you said, Farrell just awoken that in me. I don't want to be held hostage by Caterpillar. I don't want to give up the Jews right to a homeland, or my disgust at Benjamin Netanyahu's government and what's being done with the settlements on the left bank. But the issue is actually not about that. This issue of divestiture has to do with the greed and corruption of corporate America, holding all of us hostage. Oh my God. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. Dana? Well, I thank the Black Lives Matter movement for giving me an epiphany last year of realizing, really, the UU movement, sometimes kicking and screaming over the century and a half or so, has been about holding up oppressed lives as mattering. We have such a good history of supporting women's rights and gay rights, LGBTQI rights, immigrant rights, women's reproductive freedom, Jewish rights. Our saints, the Sharps, went to Europe and saved Jewish children from the Holocaust. And I think the trick in this issue is to be sure that we're holding up Jewish lives as mattering, Israeli lives as mattering, and Palestinian lives as mattering. And I agree with Denny that we're being held hostage by corporate America and, and blood money. Thank you all for sharing so personally. A large part of the purpose of this presentation is to model the genuine engagement that the UUA wants to inspire across its faith community. One way that the Public Conversations Project does this is to invite people to ask genuinely curious questions of one another, to try to come to a deeper understanding of what others believe, and to allow people to be more fully understood so would like to use the few minutes that we have left to allow each of you to ask another person on stage a genuinely curious question. The purpose of that question is to understand some part of that person's experience or perspective more deeply. And we only have a few minutes, so we'll try to speak briefly. So, Farrell, tomorrow we will debate. I don't even know which side I'm going to be on. <laughs> you can be on my side. <laughs> but here's my question. If we vote yes to a resolution which will ask the UUA to do something it's already done, is that Will that make us feel good? I mean, will we have done something to bring peace 
among the Jews and the Palestinians? I mean, is, is that the issue to get so excited about? So let, I mean, is let, that the real work, Pharaoh? Oh, there's a lot of real work to be done. You know, it's not ending here. It's not ending at this GA. Uh, it's going on into the future. And it's a step forward, in my opinion. It's a step forward. It's not an end. It will not give us peace tomorrow. But it, it's a, it is a step forward. We're not the only ones who are doing this. There are churches all over this country who are doing the same thing, and pretty much for the same reasons. I know how but you feel. The Methodists don't have feel. anything better than that. I know you. you were going to cry. You even said you might cry up here on the stage. But uh, I think it is a step forward. I think this church deserves to do this because it's, it's something that we all really, I think, believe in down deep. And it's something that we will work for in the future as well. Thank you for your question. I know how I'm going to vote tomorrow, but <laughs> um, uh, so, so um, I guess my question would be, you know, I, I went to the, um, there was an event last night and there were some really beautiful, powerful testimonies uh, from some Palestinian Americans and Palestinians, but you know, one of the comments uh, that, that caught my attention was, uh, uh, occupation for 50 years. And so what I hear when I hear that, I'm not saying they meant this, but what I hear is that means they do not accept the existence of the state of Israel. And so I would like to know, do you accept the existence of the state of Israel as a Jewish state? And would you promote that in our work for peace? I would. I really believe that we need a state of Israel side by side with the state of Palestine. Even my 17-year-old daughter, <laughs> I asked her, I said, what do you think, one state or two states? And she said, are you crazy? <laughs> There's been so much violence, people need to be separated. So yes, we need a Jewish state and we need a Palestinian state and there needs to be a long process of healing and reconciliation, which is already happening. There are many groups that work on that and I, completely support such groups that try to build the conversations and help the way forward. Question. Do you want to answer? Oh, no. Oh, you. Right. Want to ask a question? Yeah, a question. Okay. You know, I would, I would ask uh, Denny and, and Reverend Jay, uh, what is it about, what is it that you can find in this resolution that offends you? It, it doesn't offend me, it just doesn't satisfy me. It doesn't satisfy me because of what I just said. It's not really the solution. But what I find troubling and yes, offensive uh, about this, the, the, this work on divestiture is that it is part of the greater movement which you referred to before called BDS which many of its leaders do not, in fact, recognize the right of Israel to exist. At your own booth yesterday, there are people, fellow Unitarian Universalists, who tried to persuade me that the Jews had no right to a homeland in Israel. It was like being raped. It was horrible. So, you know, we're so good at having AIWs and, and, and business resolutions that make us feel good. We're, we're great at, oh, well, that's done. Now we can go home and feel good. It's just not enough. And for me, I, I would say it doesn't, re to me, it's, it's uh, very one-sided, and it's taking one side of this conflict, a war between two countries that's been going on for a long time, and it doesn't take into account the other side of the equation, which includes suicide bombings and, and bombing attacks from Hamas uh, against Israel. That, that 
lives in fear. And, and not just against Jews in Israel, it's against Arabs in Israel. Bombs are consistently, now they found a way to defend themselves in some ways against it, so they can limit the damage, but they are consistently attacked by, by the Palestinian people. And so they have a right to defend themselves and they do not have to, for once in the history of millennium, they do not have to be sacrificed. It's, it's, it's not okay to say it's okay for Jews to die. And we say we're, we're, they're not going to die. We want them, they want to live. And so they stand up for themselves. And, and I would like at least some recognition of that, if you, if you ask, since you asked. <laughs> You can clap. That's a <laughs> Are there other questions? I, I had a question. You talked about refuge. Mm -hmm. uh, can you share? Uh, you, you, I assume you've been to Israel. No. No, never. Okay. Can then can you tell me what Israel? Uh, just the idea of Israel means for you in terms of refuge, even though you don't live there. You know, what does that mean for you? So. It, it, it comes from a, a history, a long history of oppression. And uh, as my mother said to me many years ago, she said, just because you call yourself a Unitarian Universalist, they're still going to come for you if they come for the Jews. And so, uh, and, and so it is, it is a mindset of a place of last resort that nobody in Germany thought, I mean, they were integrated, they fought for Germany, they were integrated to the highest levels of society of Germany and many other countries and, and were almost exterminated. Mm -hmm. And so there is, there is always that fear. Uh, and we see the rise of a political right, a hate in our country here and now today. Mm -hmm. It could very easily turn as historically uh, Christians have in the past against Jews. And so it is a mindset of a, a place of last resort that, that we could go to. Farrell, did you want to ask, answer that question? Well, I want to say, you know, it, this resolution is not oh, an anti-Israel resolution. You're, you're, it's, it's a resolution that's against these companies who are doing this in occupied Palestinian area. I'm very sensitive as a Jew to, to anti-Semitism as well. But you know what's important in the future? This is as important to Israel and Israelis as it is to Palestinians. Because the moral fiber, the moral fiber of Israel, if you don't know about it, you should find out, is going down and down and down with the Netanyahu government and others. Because, the, and that's why this is important to show that this affects Israelis as well as it affects Palestinians. Not as much because the Pal Palestinians are the ones who are really suffering from the occupation. But the Israelis suffer too as a result of this incredible situation of imbalance, enormous imbalance in power. Um, I'm sad about the applause. We've turned it into a debate. About? Uh, I, I'm sad about the applause for one oh. side or another. Yeah. You I, know, that's, I, I apologize. That's, we hadn't talked about applause and, uh, and, just, and reaction. It's not, it's not what we were going to do. Yeah, I guess we hadn't. And, and, and um, my, you know, we should have sort of maybe made some ground rules. I didn't expect it in some ways. This is a sad. public event. Everything is a debate. I, well, I hope that I hope that we're hearing some um, support for people and for uh, the stories that you've told and for some of the the deep sharing that you've given, as well. I have a question. Yeah. Could we just be silent for a while, just all of us, uh, just for ten seconds? Could we just be? silent with it. Thank you. 
I appreciate the opportunity and the invitation to reflect. It's a, it's a deep part of this work and it's an important part of it. Donna, I know that you had wanted to say something and then maybe we'll wrap it up. I was gonna say, I had the same thought that Denny did when I was hearing the applause and some of the cheering and I feel like maybe this is not the right thing to do in this discussion and that maybe even during the debate on Saturday we could refrain from clapping and cheering because we're all one association and I think we need to hold each other up in light and love and the clapping and the applause, I really don't think it's needed. Well, thank you all. Thank you all for being here for the moment of reflection in silence. Uh, there's never a good time to end a conversation like this and hopefully it won't end. Hopefully it will go from this out into the halls and will continue and that uh, will bring a similar kind of discernment, a similar kind of reflection, care for one another out into our conversations and into tomorrow's debate and beyond into the work of peace, which I think is, as it was expressed here, the goal of everybody. So I thank you for this opportunity and I turn it back to uh, the moderator. Mr. Moderator. Jim. Thank you. Thank you to the panelists, for sure, for being honest, vulnerable, compassionate for the others on the platform. Uh, and thank John for, I think, a, uh, a professional facilitation of a very, very sensitive subject. Applause is appropriate. The Angus H. McLean Award was established in 1972 by the St. Lawrence University Theological School Alumni Association and the Religious Education Department of the UUA. It is awarded each year to someone who's made outstanding contributions to religious education. This year, the honor goes to Judith A. Frederani. Please welcome Jessica York, Faith Development Director, for the presentation of the Angus McLean Award. Thank you, Jim. Good morning. As I go about my work in service to our faith, I'm aware of the great need for those who keep the flame. Keeping the flame to me is not a passive role. It's about much more than just carrying on a legacy. A keeper can hold a light onto an organization so we may keep its stated goals in sight. And more than that, a keeper can use the light of the flame to discern the true desires of our faith, those buried deep in our hearts, the ones that are sometimes hidden or of which we may be too scared to speak, lest they prove too ambitious. In our faith, we need those who keep the flame of justice, the flame of a burning desire to make meaning of our daily existence, the flame of the communal fire, the flame of a mighty love, strong enough to tear down walls, persistent enough to be passed down from generation to generation. This award is about nothing if not a sign of our gratitude for those who keep the flame. When Judith Frediani left her position as the Director of Religious Education at First Parish, Bedford, to become the Curriculum Director at the UUA in 1985, she accepted a flame. Over the next 28 years, moving from that position to Director of Lifespan Faith Development and Resource Development Office, Judith created curricula, facilitated workshops, 
supervised staff, as you would expect. But she also used her position to lift up social justice, lifelong learning, and the very profession of religious education. Under Judith's direction, religious education curricula and resources asked us to engage with themes of justice as a foundational element of what it means to be a Unitarian Universalist. Her own passion for anti-racism, anti-oppression work, melded with that of our associations. Race to justice, rainbow children, weaving the fabric of diversity and in our hands are just some of the curricula created during Judith's first decade at the UUA. In later years, Judith brought to life two of the most ambitious and successful projects of the UUA, both of which are also filled with a call for justice. Our whole lives has changed the landscape of comprehensive sexuality education. It is currently used not only in congregations, but in many secular settings. Judith was the project manager for our whole lives, editor and author of the adult level Sexuality in Our Faith and Tapestry of Faith. <laughs> the new core curricula was a decade in the making. Many stakeholders helped shape the vision of a free online lifespan curriculum that would ensure a rich common learning experience for all Unitarian Universalists. Judith was responsible for taking all those ideas and making something focused and complete out of them. Today we have over 15,000 pages online of 40 programs for preschoolers to elders. <laughs> A master's level credentialed religious educator, Judith directed the Renaissance program to provide professional development to religious educators and other congregational leaders. She taught Unitarian Universalist religious education at Harvard Divinity School for 13 years, inspiring and informing divinity students with a broad understanding and an active commitment to religious education in their future ministries. Collaboration amongst religious professionals and between the staff groups she directed and other teams, both within the UUA and outside, has been a hallmark of her tenure. She recruited staff amongst Unitarian Universalists of color and those who bring the same anti-oppression lens and collaborative skills to their work that she herself possesses. Yet one of the most profound flames Judith has kept alive is as an advocate for religious education and religious educators as central to the very core of our faith. Judith understands that the teaching is just as important to a liberal religious faith as the preaching. For how can we be informed enough to make faithful choices in our life without the reflection and practice religious education brings? Judith recognized the need for institutional support for religious educators and other religious professionals who focus on faith development. She tirelessly witnessed to this need at district and congregational gatherings as a member of the Liberal Religious Educators Association and at the UUA's Leadership Council, where for many years she was able to speak to the importance of religious educators as leaders in our faith. <laughs> Judith has kept a burning faith in the worth of our community of religious educators. Sparks of meaning-making have been fed by her devotion to educating a generation of children, youth, young adults, adults, elders, lay leaders, ordained ministers, and religious educators. The flame of justice and Unitarian Universalism truly burns brighter because of Judith Frediani. So today, I honor a wise teacher, a staunch advocate for religious educators, 
a mentor, and a prophetic leader. The 2016 Angus H. McLean Award for Excellence in Religious Education goes to Judith A. Frediani. Thank you, thank you. Um, thank you, Jessica, for your remarkably humbling words and for the bright flame that you carry for our faith. Angus McLean wrote, to be a Unitarian Universalist all the time is almost too much to ask. <laughs> he was referring to the sometimes burden of our theological freedom and the lofty values to which we aspire. Yet we cherish that burden, a burden made tolerable by communities of all ages, engaged in lifelong learning, meaning making, celebrating, and just trying to do the right thing. I call that engagement religious education. Please keep it up, and thank you. Congratulations, Judith. Faith development's not just central to what we do, it's all that we do. The UUA bylaws state a congregation becomes a member upon acceptance by the Board of Trustees of the Association of its written application for membership in which it subscribes to the principles of and pledges to support the association. Our principles and purposes close with this promise. As free congregations, we enter into covenant, promising to one another our mutual trust and support. So let's bring back Denise Rimes, who has another role beyond her vice moderator one, and that is with APF, our annual program fan. Thanks so much, Jim. How many of you have ever been asked to serve on your stewardship committee in your congregation, whether you chose to or not? Raise your hand. And I bet some measure of you have said, no, I can't ask for money. Well, I'm one of those people. Uh, as a member of First UU in Richmond, Virginia, I have been, was asked over and over again to please help raise money. And finally, I caved to the pressure and now I have the great joy and privilege, along with my dear friend, Neil Lickman, from Naperville, Illinois. Neil, can you just give us a, sh a wave? Uh, as a co-chair of the Generosity Network, a group that seeks to increase all of our congregations' understanding about and commitment to the annual program fund and to gift in the Southern region. I am here to say thank you. We gather together in Columbus from near and far. Depending on your context, there may be times when you feel a little bit removed from other congregations. General Assembly gives us one of those experiences that makes it very clear the strength of our connections to one another. Thank you for making this event and other, many other events possible through your support of our annual program fund and gift. Now, as I go through this presentation, when I say these words, together we share a vision and a promise, I hope that you will respond by saying, through APF and gift, we support one another and amplify the best of Unitarian Universalism. So hold that thought and we'll be there in a moment. We're an association of congregations bound together in covenant. This might seem like a very theoretical, sort of fancy concept, but what does it actually mean to us? It means that we, all of us, 
promise to support one another in tangible and intangible ways, through good times and bad. It means we are here for each other. It means that none of our congregations exist in isolation. It means we are better together. When the UU Congregation of Northern Nevada in Reno had the Black Lives Matter, Matter banner defaced, then a second banner stolen, individuals within the congregation went ahead and bought three replacements, a sad testament to today's world, but three replacements just in case they'd be needed. Then the UU Church of Ogden, Utah had their Black Lives Matter banner stolen and the folks in Reno heard about it. Guess what happened next? The generous hearts in Reno sent our Ogden Unitarian Universalists a new banner. Together we share a vision and a promise. Through APF and GIFT, we support one another and amplify the best of Unitarian Universalism. When the minister of our UU congregation in Norfolk, Virginia died tragically, the board of my congregation in Richmond, Virginia empowered our minister to go serve the Norfolk congregation through their period of grief and confusion. We knew that we would want someone to do the very same thing for us. We know that we are all connected. Together we share a vision and a promise. Through APF and GIFT, we support one another and the amplify the best of Unitarian Universalism. Think of something that you are proud of in your congregation, the building your church purchased in which you offer transitional housing to refugees in the community the OWL curriculum taken out into the community, a ministry of presence on the street corner every week showing that you stand on the side of love. Perhaps you're, you're proud of the youth service that reminds you just how remarkable our young people are that they co we collectively raise for the fair wages that you prioritize your hardworking staff. What about the community partnerships you made that are building greater justice in your town? The garden that you grow, the music that you make, the food you pack for the hungry. Friends, we are part of one another's stories. Not only do we strengthen one another, we also learn best practices from one another. Unitarian Universalism is more interesting more challenging and more enriching because of you. Your support of the annual program fund and gift is a concrete expression of our pledge to support one another and each other and allows us to do far more than we could as individual congregations. And we hear and we learn from you. We continue to discuss congregational membership dues to the association. You heard some conversation about that earlier. Earlier this year, a joint board and staff task force undertook the challenge of examining how we might share our financial support in a more equitable and consistent way. How might we reassess giving so that the funding of the annual pro program fund is shared more evenly across our UUA? There's not a simple solution, and even the answers lie very deep in our values as Unitarian Universalists. We're talking to a lot of you about, our, uh, about your thoughts, and we we'll welcome your further conversation and ideas at the uh, Stewardship and Development booth. There'll be more, a lot more information to come this fall about our findings and recommendations, so please, please stay tuned because the impact will eventually find its way to all of us. Together, we share a vision and a promise. Through APF and GIFT, we support one another and amplify the best of Unitarian Universalism. You are there in Black Lives Matter in Reno, Nevada, Ogden, Utah, and countless 
other communities. You are showing up to companion the grieving church in a time of congregational crisis in Norfolk, Virginia and countless other places. You are making it possible for OWL to be taken out into the communities across our great country. You are increasing the odds for love, justice, and joy through your gifts. When your congregation became a member of our Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations, a part of the process was making a promise, a covenant, a pledge of support to the association and its member congregations. Your support of the annual program fund is the concrete expression of this pledge and your contributions to APF and GIFT are the fulfillment of a promise that has already been made. We thank you for your generosity. You make all of this and more very possible. And we ask you to strengthen your support and recommit to caring for one another. You are encouraged to financially support our larger faith from a sense of interconnectedness and with gratitude for all the ways, large and small, that other Unitarian Universalists are supporting your community, just as you are supporting theirs, whether you even know it or not. You are asked to give to fulfill the promise that has already been made, as together we proclaim we are all in this together through our support of the annual program fund and gift. We amplify the best of Unitarian Universalism. On behalf of the Unitarian Universalists across our association who benefit from your giving, we thank you, thank you, thank you for your collective generosity. Thank you, Denise. Now I want to bring back the Reverend Mary Catherine Moore, Director of Stewardship and Development and Special Advisor to the President. Mary Catherine. Friends, we receive an inheritance. The Reverend Dr. Peter Rabel, inspired by Hebrew scripture, describes our inheritance this way. We warm ourselves by fires we did not light. We sit in the shade of trees we did not plant. We drink from wells we did not dig. Now, we honor some of the generous Unitarian Universalists who have died this year. Here are people who, in our congregations and in our larger association, have been lighting the fires that warm and guide our work today. In gratitude, we remember.
We honor these lives, friendships, and memories as we work together to nurture and grow Unitarian Universalism across our association and the world, knowing that what they dreamed be ours to do. Amen. I'm pleased to uh, bring you a greeting from Ken Burns. Hi, I'm Ken Burns. I'm sorry I could not join you, but I am honored to have an opportunity to welcome all of you to the General Assembly and to provide an early look at our new film, Defying the Nazis, The Sharps War. My co-director, Artemis Joukowsky, and I are delighted to share this extraordinary story of two Unitarians whose lives fully embody the ideals you hold as a community. We were very fortunate to have the Unitarians as a partner on this film and greatly look forward to working with you to spread the word about the broadcast and the deeper values that the Sharps so personified. You should, of course, be proud of their work and the work of so many other Unitarians to create a better world for their neighbors here and throughout the world. For more information about the film, please visit defyingthenazis.org. See, I'm connected. Left the comfort of a peaceful, small Massachusetts home in order to go into Europe on the verge of war. They were motivated from the beginning to go out there into the kingdom of hell and try to get some people out. It was the second Sunday night of 1939. I had done a full day's work at the church and decided to spend an evening in front of our fireplace. The telephone rang, and it was probably the most momentous telephone call that I ever received. Hello, wait still. I knew whose voice it was. The voice of my closest friend, Everett Baker. Would you and Martha come over to talk with me at our house here? Yes. He said, wait still, Martha. I am inviting you to undertake the first intervention against evil by the denomination to be started immediately overseas. 
my husband and I felt that something should be done. Refugees in the Sudetenland had been murdered, and people had been imprisoned and hurt. We had two small kids, including a very tiny daughter. I said, how many men have you offered this to? Seventeen, he said. I said, do I understand they've all turned you down? Yes. They think a war is definitely coming and they don't want to be in danger. I reassured Martha, missionaries leave their children. I'm sure ours can be left in good hands. I want to go, but I won't go without you. I knew I would miss the children terribly, but we would only be away for a few months. I was torn between my love and duty to my children and to my husband. As my wife Martha and I went home under the starry skies, we went home with a promise to do it. core belief of uh, movements like the Unitarian and Universalist movements, belief in freedom, freedom of thought, in the use of reason and tolerance of difference. It's a faith that very importantly stresses that the shape of human history, the future of history, is in human hands. A Unitarian minister with profound conviction a woman who had been deeply committed all her life to social justice, two people very much aware of the world around them, were handed an incredible invitation, a very frightening invitation, a very demanding invitation because of its implications for their family and their church, but an enormous opportunity to actually change history. This September, with the film's PBS broadcast and the publication of Beacon Press' companion book, everyone will be talking about the Sharps' powerful story. We have a unique opportunity to advance our values of justice, compassion, equity, and carry on the Sharps' brave legacy. Certainly, there's much to do in the world, and you've heard some of that this week. I encourage you to sign up your congregation to join the Defying the Nazis UU Action Project, co-sponsored by the UUA, the UU Service Committee, and the FAS Collaborative at Meadville Lombard Theological School. The project asks UUs to use interfaith partnerships to address anti-Muslim bigotry and the refugee crisis as modern-day parallels to the Sharps' work. Here are two congregations who are already taking action. First, the Bell Street Chapel in Providence, Rhode Island, partnered with the Council on American-Islamic Relations and other interfaith and secular allies to counter-protest anti-refugee speakers at the Rhode Island State House, proclaiming their messages of welcome with their standing on the side of love shirts. And second, Bay Area UU Church in Houston got national attention for the solidarity event they organized with the Clear Lake Islamic Center to decry the Texas governor's executive order barring Syrian refugees, refugees from the state. So visit uua.org slash sharp story to share what your congregation is doing about Islamophobia and refugee solidarity. And put yourself on the map. Download the key resources, including a congregational action guide with suggested events, a set of guidelines, for, inter for interfaith dialogue and a re refugee advocacy toolkit. You can visit the UUA and the UUSC booths in the exhibit hall for more information. Using, and you can use the hashtag pound sign we defy to join the conversation on social media. So right now, everyone, take out your phones or 
notebook, however you record dates, and mark September 20th in your calendar as the date when the documentary airs on PBS. And write down a reminder to get connected with the Defying the Nazis UU Action Project online or here at GA. A word of thanks for Artemis Tchaikovsky, who was not only the film's director, but also grandson of the Sharps, and whose tireless efforts have made this possible. If we have the camera on Artemis, I believe he's in the front row here somewhere. Tell me where, there, there he is right here. Put the camera on Artemis. When I was a candidate um, for moderator and had a, uh, a booth in the exhibit hall, Artemis had a booth across and uh, tagged on my sleeve one day and gave me this, this uh, CD, uh, DVD, of uh, the, the sort of the first iteration of what you just saw, a trailer. Uh, and it captured my attention, and I hope it will capture yours. Thank you, Artemis. Thanks also to the staff of UUA, UUSC, Meadville Lombard, and the UU congregation at Shelter Rock and other leaders who are making this all happen. So we can carry on the Sharps' legacy to, hate, to, to defy hatred, bigotry, and fear by taking action for freedom, justice, and solidarity. Remember, hashtag we defy. Now welcome to the podium our financial advisor, Larry Ladd. Larry Ladd is an institution and a force of nature within Unitarian Universalism. Three years ago, as the new moderator, two weeks into my new role, two weeks, the down month when nothing happens in Unitarian Universalism, the financial advisor who had just been elected resigned. So Larry came to my rescue and saved my bacon. I'll let him tell you more about that. It was three years ago. I was in North Carolina, driving along U.S. Route 70, heading north to my client, Wake Forest University. It had been almost two weeks since I had completed my work as chair of the UUA Nominating Committee. A year since I gave up my work as board chair of the Meadville Lombard Theological School, and eight years since my two terms as UUA financial advisor had reached their conclusion. Twenty years of continuous service. Then a call came on my cell phone. I answered the call. It was Jim Key, the person who had just been elected financial advisor, had quit. Would I consider serving as financial advisor once again? I hemmed and hawed for at least a minute. <laughs> because I always, and then I answered in the affirmative, because I always have. <laughs> I still recall the very first call. It was in 1964, and from Ann Davidson, the newly elected president of the liberal religious youth group of my church in Grafton, Massachusetts. She asked if I would serve as corresponding secretary of the group. My job was to remind and entice the youth group members to come each week to our meetings. I knew that it was the program that would attract, 
So I focused on making sure we had substance to offer. And I haven't stopped since. Eventually, I became national president of LRY and was elected in 1969 to serve on the Commission on Appraisal. At that point, the youngest person elected by the General Assembly to an office. Since then, I've been elected by GA to one office or another in four different decades. Each time, I answered the call in the affirmative. Now I stand before you three years after that most recent call. Every day of service is an honor and a joy. You will never hear me groan and complain. I am looking forward to the next call. The financial condition of the UUA is stable. Our balance sheet is very strong. The quality of oversight is excellent. Our financial practices are above average for an organization of our size. The board and administration take their stewardship responsibilities very seriously. We make our mistakes, but they are corrected and we move on. The governance condition of the UUA is generally very good. The smaller board size and the end of district representation have improved board performance. There is more diversity. The board can think more deeply and focus only on board level matters. The UUA, like your congregation, still has too many committees. They misdirect volunteer energy away from mission-focused work. The shorter terms of officers and trustees, coupled with annual elections, are inhibiting the long-term focus that makes change possible. I see the decline of our membership numbers and RE enrollments as troubling, even though I know those are flawed measures. As a history buff, I know that the Unitarian movement suffered similarly in the 1930s and revived itself, and that Unitarian Universalism suffered similarly in the 1970s and revived itself. But there's also the story of universalism in the 20th century, which suffered a gradual decline without reviving itself, all the while congratulating itself on its virtues. I am hopeful and devote all of my volunteer energies toward justifying that hope. I see hope in the ministers who are assuming leadership within our movement and our most vibrant congregations. My family is doing its part to contribute some of those ministers. I see hope in the congregations that are thriving because of their spiritual depth and mission focus. I see hope in our commitment to Black Lives Matter and LGBTQ work, and in our commitment to becoming an anti-racist, anti-oppressive, multicultural movement. I see hope when I see us cast aside old structures like committees and districts that divert our energies inward rather than on mission. I am grateful 
to have made a difference in the UUA in so many ways, including strengthening the clergy compensation program, including establishing a unified retirement plan, improving oversight by creating an audit committee, among many other steps, institutionalizing our commitment to socially responsible investing, and finding qualified and committed people to serve our association. I'm grateful to have helped the Meadville Lombard Theological School transform itself and thrive. And I'm glad that I helped the Star King School for the Ministry at a time of great need. When I was growing up and attending Sunday school, there were certain phrases that seem almost antique that have stayed with me and that I repeat often as silent mantras. The first is the James Freeman Clark phrase, salvation by character. Not the rest of the statement, but just those three words, salvation by character. The second is the reworking of the lines that originated with James Viola Blake. Love is the doctrine of this church, and service is its prayer. And service is its prayer. I am grateful for every opportunity for service. I answer each call and say yes. That is my prayer. Amen. He saved my bacon and he saved yours. The general session seems to be focused on financial issues, and I have gathered the six presidents of UUA, UUSC, UUMA, CLF, Star King, and Meadville Lombard. Such power. I want to share with all of you some great news. These folks have been working together for some time to share resources and coordinate capital campaigns so donors could share their gifts with all of our Unitarian institutions. Well, today we can announce the Wake Now Our Vision campaign. A collaborative campaign has increased, has received a $5 million grant from the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Shelter Rock. Shelter Rock, you may applaud. Shelter Rock, is calling on us to consider our legacy, to plant for the future, to wake to a vision of our shared future in faith. This challenge grant from Shelter Rock reflects their own remarkable experience stewarding the gift of Carolyn Veach that has taught them the power of legacy gifts, and now they are inspiring us to build our own bright future through this challenge. What a gift, and we thank you. Thank you all. <laughs> we have um, the results are in on the CSA, CSAI voting, uh, and we have two um, CSAI two and CSAI four that we'll need to vote in favor of to do a runoff, if you will, to see which CSAI advances. So it's probably time to get your um, voting cards out. And what I'm going to do is ask you to raise your cards if you want to vote for two, which is, uh, give me the name of the two. Do we have that on the screen? I don't have that in front of me. I should know it. I didn't hear that. 
race, national conversation on race uh, is uh, CSI 2. So if you favor that, when I call for the vote, not yet, when, you, when I call for the vote, you raise your card for that one. On the other hand, if you um, want to vote on corruption of our democracy, CSI 4, then you raise your card for that. It will determine which one gets the most votes of all those voting. We understand? Are we ready? So all of those in favor of CSAI 2, a national conversation on race, please raise your card. Thank you. Lower your cards, please. Lower your cards, please. Those of you that wish to vote for CSAI 4, the corruption of our democracy, raise your card. We think we agree, but we're going to ask to do this again. And I would ask for, um, we don't need any shout outs here. We just need you to raise your card for either two or four. Those that support a national conversation on race, CSEI 2, please raise your cards and hold them up for a while. Thank you. Lower the cards. Thank you. Those who wish to support CSEI 4, the corruption of our democracy, raise your cards. Sorry, folks, I'm going to keep you for a while. It seems so close, I think we're going to have to call for a count. So tellers, could you take your positions to begin to count? I'm going to ask you to raise your hands in a minute. You're going to have to hold them up for a while while we do the counts. So I'm asking the tellers to get organized to, to be able to count their sections. They're already prepared to do this, and they will hand me the results. And then we have a few announcements before you go to lunch. And we're ahead of schedule. Is this not cool or what? So tellers, are you ready to count? Are we in position? I need a high sign from the tellers. Okay, we all seem to be at our positions. Those in favor of supporting CSAI 2, a national conversation on race, raise your cards and hold them for a while, even if you have to put your hand under your elbow to do that. Support the elbow. We can do this. We're people of faith and courage and stamina. And creaky elbows. And I'll leave it to the tellers to tell which section to lower their hands. But right for the moment until you get a high sign from a teller. Those poor folks in the back, they really had to hold them up a long time. Thanks for your patience, folks. I know your stomach is grumbling. This is worthwhile, folks. This is, uh, both of these are incredibly important. And, uh, and no matter which one uh, gets the majority, um, they both certainly should occupy our congregations and our associations' intentions and 
direction. Tellers, how are we doing? I should learn to sing, I think. No, it's probably better that I don't learn to sing. Tellers, speak to me. If one of you is just adding up all the sections, we can vote the, uh, the second process. We have finished two, so we'll be collecting those votes. So now I'm going to ask those of you who have not voted uh, to vote for uh, those of you who wish to vote for CSEI 4 the corruption of our democracy, please raise those cards and the same advice, just put the hand under the elbow and hold it up there until you get the sign from the, um, the tellers. Thank you for this. How's the morning been for you? <laughs> Do you need a teller to help hold up your elbow? <laughs> Was the panel discussion worthwhile for you to help in your own discernment? We ought to have some videos on, on standby that we could run to entertain you while, uh, while we do these counts. We're trying to get the online counts as well. The 110 votes could make a difference, so. We may defer the announcement of the count until we get the online in. I will proceed. Once we get this count in, we will uh, move to some announcements while we sort through the counts in the House and the counts offline. Hold one moment.
Thank you, Sarah Dan. We're having some technical difficulties with the offside vote, so I'm going to delay announcing the vote until we know what the vote is. Do you think that's fair? And uh, in the meantime, we'll go with some announcements and see if we can collect all of the votes. Um, before I call on the secretary, I want to recognize uh, another special congregation. The Accessibility and Inclusion Ministry, the AIM program, a joint program of the UUA and Equal Access, was announced in 2015 and has granted certification to the first congregation to have come through the program. Drum roll. The Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Ann Arbor. <laughs> This has come after three years of hard and significant work by the Ann Arbor Congregation on disability issues. Some of the things they've done, two worship services focused on disability issues, four workshops on inclusion, depression forum, memory improvement, intergenerational workshop, accessibility projects, large print hymnals, signage, parking lot improvements, inclusion projects that include mental health, social justice projects, Detroit Airport Accessibility, funding grant to local disability and advocacy organizations. Congratulations to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Ann Arbor. Thank you very much to being uh, the first. <laughs> Rob, we're now ready for you. Up here we have convened the first gathering, uh, official gathering, of older, white, bald men <laughs> supporting Unitarian Universalism, and we thank you for your indulgence. It's a cliché, but I represent that remark. First, a shout out to the Youth Caucus. Are you here? Yeah, all right. So the reason I'm announcing the Youth Caucus is because I want to celebrate the ministry and work of Larry Ladd, who just offered his final report as financial advisor because he comes from there, friends. And I come from there, and for all of you who support the deepening involvement and empowerment of young people in this movement. Thank you and congratulations. I want you to know that the third international convocation of Unitarian Universalist women will be held in this coming February 16th through 19th, 2017 at the historic and gorgeous Asilomar Conference Center in Monterey, California. This is the third such gathering. Uh, both of the first two attracted over 600 women from around the world to make a powerful impact on women's lives, to network with others for positive change, to learn about ground working, groundbreaking initiatives that transform lives, and to meet commu committed Unitarian Universalists from around the world, and in this particular iteration, to renew spirits overlooking the Pacific. They would like to invite you to visit their booth in the, pair, in the exhibit hall or to uh, visit them on their website. That's the International Convocation of Unitarian Universalist Women. And lastly, I want you to remember, we want you to remember the covenantal question. What shall we promise each other 
and in what interest? It is that question we will be asking as we engage in a presidential election season this coming year. The Presidential Candidates Forum will be held tomorrow in this room at 1.15, and your Board of Trustees urges you to be here to meet the candidates, hear what they have to say, and engage in this process at depth, because, my friends, covenant is not a noun, it's a verb, and it's the heart of our religious practice. Yesterday, I did a shout out. People raised their hands if they'd been uh, to GA uh, more than 35 years, and I got some response. Um, Gary Smith, who's online, uh, has been to at least 35 uh, General Assemblies. Uh, Harry Hicks has been to 39. We have a tie for 44. Jay Atkinson, Beverly, and Margaret Link, all have been here, both have been here 44 years. And I think I have some information for you. One moment. I can announce that CSAI, and I, let, let's not be too rowdy, and I don't think they're winners and losers here. These are both very worthy CSAI. So I would just caution uh, too much exuberance and be thankful that we have participated in this democratic process. Uh, and both initiatives should certainly go forward by your individual congregations and others. But CSAI 4, um, a conversation on democracy is the CSI that will go forward to possibly become a statement of conscience. So thank you. There being no further business to come before us, in accordance with the schedule set forth in your program book, I declare that this general session of the General Assembly shall stand in recess until 8.30 a.m. on Saturday, June 25, 2016. Be there. <laughs>